Sword Pilgrim Chapter 31 The well and all the leftover food in the village that the orcs enjoyed had already been poisoned. And quite some time had passed since then. No matter how savage they might have been, they would not be able to fully digest the venom Callius had left for them as a present. And now there was a chance to slaughter them. If you don't want to follow, I won't force you. I guess that's all you amount to. Callius ignored them thereafter and drew the predator sword, lows from his waist. It had swallowed a lot of blood the last few days, so a lot of the breakage had regenerated, and there were no visible gaps on its blade anymore. Not long left. After completing this quest, Lowe's will smoothly become a spirit sword. There won't be much difference in terms of unique abilities, but it'll still be better than nothing. I'll go first. Callius left the hesitating knights behind, and headed for the village. Bruns, moving to follow him, exclaimed. Heh! Shameful bastards! Is there anyone here who doesn't owe his life? To think that knights who keep babbling about honor and pride would be so low class. TSK, TSK. Even a dog knows to guard the house where it gets its food, but you guys behave like this? It's a shame to call you knights, it's a pity. If this is what you're like, just put down your sword. Hearing something like that from a servant, several knights rose up. Startled, Bruns moved closer to Callius. Shut up, Bruns. Yes, yep. After a while. Hey, are you just going to sit still? I'm not shameless enough to keep my sword sheathed after hearing that from a servant who is not even a knight. It's embarrassing. I'm going too. If there's something you believe in, you have to go. Me too. Anyway, there'll be nowhere to go if the North is destroyed. My home is here. Besides, he's the one who saved my life, and there must be some plan. By ones and twos. Watching the knights rising, Emily gave Callius a curious glance. Shrum. Emily drew her sword. And strode after Callius. Even a child only a little over twelve years old pulled out her sword and headed towards the orcs. The knights' faces became hot at the sight. Eh, damn it. I'm going too, Fockle. Emily's actions served as the catalyst, and all the hesitant knights stood up. Some of them were just swept away by the current and followed along, but most were fascinated by the swordsmanship of the one in the lead, Callius. As Bruns said, all of them owed him their lives. So they had no other choice. The one in the lead, Callius, looked upon the orcs in the village with burning eyes. There are quite a few decent guys. There were even some orcs standing on guard. However, the village didn't look as peaceful as he expected. Pretty annoying. Callius quietly closed his eyes. Soon, the sounds of the distant village blew in the wind and arrived at his eardrums. By concentrating spirit energy on his ears, a little bit could be interpreted according to the bard's blessings. You eek! Kuyululululul. He slowly opened his eyelids and raised the corners of his mouth in a curve. I'll clear the way. Callius gave a quick glance to the knights following behind, then immediately circulated the power from his elixir field to his whole body. The bud of the six peak flowers technique slowly bloomed, caressing his tired body and filling it with divine power. Taz. His form jumped up in the air and towards the town. Enemy! The orc standing on the alert screamed so loud that his eardrums were about to burst. However, because of that, chwak! He couldn't stop the single swing of Kalia's sword. Kaarge! Brun screamed out loud. Cha! Charge! Uaaaaaa! The orcs were bewildered for a moment at the sight of the knights uncaringly rushing. But then they picked up their axes. It was supposed to be a surprise attack. I'll get Bruns for this, later. If you're still alive by then. Kong. Die. Quajik. Aaron, wielding a greatsword, killed an orc with a grin. 
The body was tired all over, and all his muscles kept throbbing, but the feeling wasn't bad. Oddly enough, dealing with the orcs wasn't as difficult as before. These guys have no strength, like sick dogs. Hey! Isn't that right, kid? Sook, Kung! I'm not a kid, I'm Alan. Aaron, with the sword on his shoulder, smiled at Alan's response, who only came to his waist in height. Alan took a small breath as he wiped the blood from his sword. But I agree with you. Their movements have slowed down. It's like they've been poisoned by something. I don't know what happened, but this raid was successful enough. With knights less than half their number, how could you win over this number of orcs? This is a merit that is not lacking by any measure. From today on, in the north, bards will sing of Callius and of us knights. Ha ha ha. That's good. Come. Quagic. Hey, hey. Die. Die. Die so they can sing my name. Chwak. Aaron panted as another orc fell, and then he saw the man at the forefront of wiping out the orcs. Should I say, as expected of a Gervain? Well, you probably don't know the rumors about Prince Callius. But those rumors don't seem very believable. Right now, in my eyes, there is no other knight braver or more honorable. Only the enemy's corpses and blood surrounded him as he slaughtered the rushing orcs, his red cloak fluttering in the wind. Maybe he didn't even need our help. Don't say stupid things. Look closely, kid. No matter how strong a knight is, his stamina is not infinite. Look at what he's doing. Callius had the upper hand even when facing two or three enemies at once. Of course, the orc's condition was abnormal, but there was no other knight on the field who could deal with their movements and attacks like that. Even so, he sometimes lost his sword from an unexpected attack, had to roll on the ground, and fight desperately. If he lost his sword, he hastily grabbed another from the corpses around him, and kept fighting with the spare sword without pausing. Prince Callius is overdoing it. He must be in a hurry. Even if he doesn't express it, he's the one leading us. Are you saying he's overdoing it for our sake? Why else would you take the lead and swing your sword like crazy? That was then. These guys. If you have time to chat like that, Go kill at least one more enemy. Don't you know how hard my master had to work to save even a single one more of you? He even prepared the scene for you by poisoning the bastards, but you keep chattering without even saying thank you. Puh, poison. Really, poison? While you guys were playing, he poisoned the well. You idiots. Tadadak. Bronze, after spitting out such foul language hid behind Emily. As Bronze said, Our time is not infinite. If you can afford to talk like that, kill one more. Yes. Well, I understand. Lady Emily. Alan and Aaron, tightly clutching the hilts of their swords, glanced at the leading Callius. They now drew their swords faster than before. I called them reckless without knowing anything. He had a plan after all. An indescribable emotion bloomed in their hearts. Kang. Steel flashed again. Sook. Sock. It felt good to slash with the sword. Lowe's was like that, the more you cut with it, the sharper it got. Lowe's, drinking more and more blood, was slowly becoming sharper and lighter than before. Kang. The trick to block the orc's axes was becoming more and more familiar. It's definitely more comfortable than the first time. The orc's unique strength. Their techniques of wielding the axe. Straightforward movements. Those things are pretty familiar by now. So, if you swing your sword like this, it will be difficult for them to stop, and if you do that, you can rush further without worrying about a counterattack. If you roughly know how they fight, it's easier to cut through them. Kwong. Leaving another orc fallen behind him covered in blood, Callius looked back. Who? The orcs who couldn't fight properly due to the poison had been left to the knights. 
he was only cutting down the opponents who still had strength. They're doing great. He saw Bruns and Emily joining forces to defeat an orc. Bruns made quick slashes with a heavy dagger to injure the orc's limbs, while Emily blew his axe away with her excellent swordsmanship. They're breathing pretty well. Bruns' swordsmanship skills weren't anything to talk about, but he was quick-witted, and Emily was making room for him to intervene in the fight. Emily caught the orc's attention, and Bruns took advantage of the gap and stabbed him deeply. The dagger Bruns was holding only had a black blade, but it was still a carcass made by Callius from an orc warrior's corpse. So, regardless of his swordsmanship skills, if he stabbed with enough force, it was enough to rip through the orc's flesh and bury it up to the hilt. Callius shook his head and calmly observed the situation around him. The tide had already turned. The remaining knights had banded together to defeat the weakened orcs. It seemed that even a villager would be enough to kill an orc dying from poison. At this point, I might have run away. But orcs did not. In such a situation, they were trying their best to take at least one more person with them to the underworld. Rather, as they were going to die anyway, they wanted to die fighting. If you die, die on the battlefield. That was one of their creeds. In the fervent belief that you must die on the battlefield to reach the embrace of their god. Orcs wander the battlefields, wielding those huge axes, hoping to die in battle. In search of the highest of honors. That had its own taste, but. It's rather good. Since the orcs are rushing in like moths to a flame, the more you can kill, the higher the level of rewards you will receive. Who? Taking a deep breath. Callius ran towards the onrushing orcs again. At the same time. Wow, he fights really well. This time, he even drew another sword, dual wielding. Is that so? Orphan was repeatedly clasping the hilt of her sword with her hands. She couldn't overcome Rene's urging, so she moved a little away from where they were originally hiding. The two of them moved alone, closer to the battle. Renee's eyes were special, so she could see places even further away even if they moved only a little. Even in the darkness before the dawn, it was the same, so Rene and Orphan held their breaths and watched the battle of the knights led by the pilgrim with the fluttering red cloak. It's all over now. It's a victory for Callius. Really, just with those idiots, somehow he annihilated a lot of orcs. Rene looked at the sweat on her palms and exclaimed as if exhaling. Awesome, that's really great. Orphan couldn't believe it. However, there was no reason for Rene to lie. If the knights had been defeated, it was them who would be in danger next. But the orcs didn't look very good. They were grunting and vomiting as they fought. Really dirty. Is that so? Yeah, it's not likely that the whole group of orcs would have a sudden stomach upset, maybe Callius had already done something underhanded? No way. They didn't have any time to do that. But even in that kind of a disadvantaged situation, Callius waged a fight on them and won. Unless you are certain of something, you cannot move like that. Especially for knight errants who have not even been properly appointed as knights. Besides, they had already suffered major and minor injuries, so in a fight with the orcs, defeat was almost certain. Even so, he forced a battle. It's not something you can do unless you're sure of something. Combining the situation and the condition of the orcs, one naturally had to think of ways Callius could have tilted the odds in advance. I don't know if he's really a Gervain. No matter how much you think of a way to make them unable to fight properly, there is no other way than poison. In addition to his swordsmanship, he has that kind of resourcefulness. He has a handsome face and is even smart, so how did he become Gervain's idiot? That's what I want to ask. Orphan laughed loudly at Rene talking to herself. Seeing that valiant figure, who would think that he was the unprecedented scapegrace of the Gervain family? What is he doing now? Sitting on a pile of orc corpses, raising his sword with the knights. If you keep quiet, you might hear them. She closed her eyes for a moment, and she indeed heard them. 
the screams of the knights were almost inaudible, flowing on the wind in the cold forest. A cry of victory resounding on the battlefield. Aya. Orphan hugged herself with her arms. Desire bloomed in her eyes. The soul of a knight was boiling. She also wanted to taste that victory on the bloody battlefield. She wanted to shout out the cry of victory boiling out from her elixir field. Ah! However, unlike the pleasant shouts she heard, she herself was in a miserable condition, standing in the freezing northern wind. As a knight of Gervain, she couldn't even wield her sword to her heart's content. Orphan's fists clenched tightly. Why can't I be there, drawing my sword? Why can't I confront the true enemies of the North, the orcs, and their demonic beasts? Orphan suppressed the momentary urge to draw her sword and rush forth. Kuduk. Orphan's grip on her sword's hilt tightened with the emotion burning in her heart. We must go now. Master Calavan may arrive here soon at dawn. Aha! Uh -huh. That was then. Renee's pupils dilated. What's going on? Red hair. Orphan's gaze burned at those words. Is that really true? That's right. Red, red hair. Red hair. Orphan. Why, a great warrior. Great orc warrior. An elite among the orc's elites, said to have powers many times greater than a normal orc warrior. Ah, uh, what should we do? If that's a great warrior, he's very strong. I read it in the books. Callius is going to die. Orphan. Despite Renée's call for help, Orphan only looked desperate. A great warrior. Even if you go to help, nothing will change. It is too far-fetched to think that those who just finished a battle can run away from a great warrior. Orphan said with a dark face. They're all. They're all dead. Chapter 32 Whying. The northern winter wind struck at the skin like knives. A chilly dawn breeze that seeps into your bones till you hunch over and evokes an unfounded nostalgia. I feel so cold, I wonder if somebody else is too. That kind of thought naturally leads to a bitter longing. That somebody may be a lover. Or family. Or someone else. Talk, talk. Under the starless morning sky. A middle-aged man stood on the walls of Javarsh enduring the cutting wind. At his waist was a sword in its scabbard, adorned with a gray jewel that resembled the eyes of Gervain, not losing its shine even in the north wind. The sword hilt appeared engraved with the mark of Gervain, signifying it as a sword passed down from generation to generation. The guardian sword that protected the north, which could only be inherited by a new patriarch from the previous one. Callus, the North Wind. The man who grabbed its hilt. No, Elberton, the patriarch of the Gervain family, waved his hand. The wind that flew through his thick fingers was quickly caught in his hand. Who? In an instant, that strong north wind descended gently into his palm like a tamed beast. The calming north wind did not make him quail. But there was the slightest trace of cherished nostalgia. Callius. The supreme ruler of the North, Albert and von Gervain. His gray pupils trembled faintly. Cough, cough. There was a wet coughing sound. It disappeared in the strong wind, and the smell of blood also quickly dissipated. Count Gervain. It was Bernard. He looked bitterly at the handkerchief in Elberton's hand. You look awful. Forget it. Albert and von Gervain. Count Gervain, head of the House of Gervain, hid the blood-stained handkerchief that was in his hand, and looked down from the castle walls. Even in this late dawn, refugees continued to knock at the gates. From here and there, many a territorial resident continued their constant journey towards Javarsh, the home of the Sword of the North. Sir Bernard. What do you think? Isn't this something you foresaw already? to some extent. However, the situation was more serious than expected. The signal from the scouts has arrived. The Orc Corps from the north are said to be on the move. 
they've been quiet for a long time. They were gathering their strength all the time, to finally reclaim the northern areas. Something that would have happened someday. A natural occurrence. But this is not a good time. That's not wrong. But the timing was not good. Winters in the north were harsh. This severe cold was a bad time to suffer from food shortages, and the war that suddenly broke out would quickly dry up the stockpiled food. It would be nice if this wind quickly passed by. The North was facing serious problems this time. How many are there? Almost 7,000, they say. The more time passes, the more it will become. 7,000 orcs. Our army. A thousand knights of Gervain and three thousand soldiers. Four thousand in total. It was an unusually large number for an army owned by a single family, only possible because the family in question was Gervain of the North. But even so. Four thousand, it's difficult. Forget about the number. The good news is that the castle has thick walls. But it doesn't make sense to stay locked up in the castle and wait out the siege. We have to prepare. We need to cut down on their troops at least a little bit. We can't let so many of the beasts reach the castle. Besides, I don't think this is all. Are you talking about Calavan? He's good at swordsmanship, and has a good brain. He's even kind and generous to the people, so he should be able to protect the northern areas. There is only one thing that the head of Gervain needs the ability and willingness to protect the North. Then why do you doubt him? He's, he's very filial. You're talking about his biological father. Yes. Unlike me, that man has a good son. Elbert invoiced his accusation. Calavan intends to kill me and make his father the patriarch. Something that would come to you if you just stay still. He's doing something foolish, because he doesn't know that I'm ill. Did you know everything from the beginning? I am Gervain's sword, and the shield that protects the north. I need to be able to notice at least that much. If so, why did you just leave it alone? If you trim the shoots in advance. Elberton quietly shut his mouth at Bernard's question. The foolishness of an old man. You're younger than me, what are you talking about? Every time I see Calavan. I keep thinking of him. You mean Callius? Elberton didn't answer. But Bernard seemed to understand. Blood does not lie. Even if it's for the family. Even a cold-blooded man who abandoned his children is still a father in the end. A parent cannot ignore a child's suffering, one. Sir Bernard. Yes. Calavan alone could not have moved the orcs. He is valiant but that is not enough to achieve such a thing. There is someone behind him. A person with experience, knowledge of the North, and a deep grudge. Perhaps one who belongs to that group. Is he a strawman? Calavan's biological father? Maybe. If he wants to become the family head, he needs a way to hold the succession ceremony quickly, too, amidst the fires of war. Threading that needle would be hard just by himself. But more than that. There was something bigger at the root of it all, so thought Elberton. Callus, the family heirloom sword in Elberton's hand, showed a slight tremor. It wasn't fear or terror. It was merely the anticipation of what was soon to come. Maybe all of this is just coincidence, but there are fewer coincidences in the world than you'd think. That's true. Sir Bernard. I may die on this battlefield. Don't say that. Your death is not the death of just an individual. Anyway, this body doesn't have very many days left to live. In that case, I think it's splendid to die honorably in the embrace of battle. The supreme ruler of the North is still just a soldier. And should face a soldier's tragic end. Bernard, who was about to refute, couldn't speak. Both Elberton and Bernard were swordsmen, and knights. He understood Elberton's unwillingness to die a shabby death. We've been at peace for too long. 
but the North has always. There's never been a battlefield like this. This is better. If the war broke out after I died, it would have been difficult to endure. Bernard felt a strange sense of deja vu. Elberton spoke as if he wanted this war. Under his hopeless demeanor, he seemed to have strange expectations. It's like he was looking for the perfect place to die. You're thinking of dying. If I die, what will happen to Gervain? What will happen to the North? Are you curious? I'm not curious. I wonder. If I die. What about Gervain? Who will lead it? Also, what kind of wind will blow in the North? Will his successor be able to tame Callus, which has accompanied him all his life? That guy. And Callius. What about his one and only son? That was then. A knight with the mark of Gervain rushed towards him. Something happened? An emergency signal from scouts. Tell me. There was a battle in the village of Dinel, and even though smaller in numbers, the knights were victorious. Triumph that arrived during this bad a situation. It's good news. Someone accomplished an honorable task. The Gervains from the branch families had not arrived yet. He thought it might be one of them. They said that a knight wearing a red cloak was leading the group. Callius! Bernard exclaimed. Elberton's pupils trembled slightly. That guy! Was he leading the knights to annihilate the orcs? Bernard didn't doubt it, but Elberton furrowed his eyebrows. It was hard to believe. However, before he even finished thinking, the soldier's report was not over yet. It is said that a great warrior was spotted, moving towards Dinel. What? A great warrior? That means somebody able to command a full corps among the orcs. Is he moving all alone? Yes. That's right. I know who it is. The great warrior who moves like a lonely specter on the battlefields. Keltuk, that's him. He had quite a unique disposition, but his abilities were not in doubt. There was no counting the number of knights of the north who had perished under his axe. I'll go. Callius alone won't have it easy. At Bernard spoke, intending to rush out, Elberton drew his sword. Gervain's heirloom. Callus, the north wind. Go. The north wind will carry you. Cheek. Soliloquy. Suddenly, a stormy wind blew. Bernard's form disappeared with the strong wind. The sword containing the northern winds, Callus. The soldier's eyes shone sharply. Although. Chuckle. Elberton's eyes twinkled. It's the first time I've seen your face. The soldier's face contorted. Taz. Tadadadat. As if it was a signal, black robed forms that looked like assassins appeared from below the wall, no longer hiding their aura. The corners of Elberton's lips rose. It was a cold smile. Is the rumor true? The supreme ruler of the north faced the dozens of assassins in his front. At his question, someone in the crowd opened their mouth. It's true. All right, then. Soon the north wind blew again. Oh, eh, eh, eh. A great shout followed. They won the battle they had thought impossible to win, so it was only natural. Even I have this exhilarating feeling, so why would they be different? Victory is valuable and joyous for everyone. Therefore, it was natural that they should exult in the joy of victory. Whying. Unfortunately, the world was not that kind. I don't like variables. Sitting on a mountain made of orc corpses, barely supporting my body with a sword, I saw someone walking alone as if wading through a sea of blood. His red hair, tied in bundles, did not flutter even in the face of the strong northern winds. Two axes with red emblems engraved on them were held in his hands, and they radiated tremendous momentum. Hair dyed red, only allowed for those highly honored for their achievements in the orc society. Blood-stained axes. 
Comparing to the Valthras church, he was on the same level as a paladin possessing a spirit sword. A great orc warrior. Ah. The wind changed with the appearance of the man. The northern wind that only felt chilly till then, was now approaching the freezing point. Gulp. It's not some other orc. Even those who did not know the history of the great warriors could not open their mouths because of his demeanor and metal. Those who had just been shouting till their throats burst, now could not utter even a word and could only swallow drilly. Shit. I mean, imagine this kind of timing. It's not pouring cold water on you, more like drowning you in it. We just won the battle, but before we could fully savor our victory, this guy appeared and demolished all our feelings of exaltation. Whether he knew this or not, the great warrior walked in slowly, and gazed intently at Callius, who was sitting on the pile of orc corpses. Kung, Kung. He put down the axes in his hands on the ground. Cricking his neck and relaxing his body, he quietly waited for the battle to commence. I, master. Shall we run away? Bruns was terrified. Quick-witted as always, he seemed to have realized that the level of the great warrior was quite different from the ones he'd met so far. Just look at him, the aura he emanates is enough to overwhelm the surroundings and sink the very air, so what can you do? Escape will be difficult. Only one enemy. However, his level far exceeded the orcs they had met till now. If you run away, you die. The moment they try to run away, they will be caught one by one and their limbs torn apart. You must fight. Fortunately, it was a great warrior. He acknowledged the etiquette of battle. He was just warming up, not rushing into attack. A leisurely arrogance. An anticipation. For the battle to come. For the brutal slaughter he shall commit. To avenge his dead comrades. Step back. Suluk. Callius loosened his cloak and stepped forward. He pulled out Lucin from his waist and stabbed it onto the ground. Lowe's scabbard was also removed. Every single possible distraction was put away. And lastly. Click. The artifact on his wrist. He loosened Vivi's bracelet. Quan. 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 Minute explosions racked Callius' body, because of the overflowing divine power raging inside him. Blood flowed from his lips as if to represent that excruciating pain. But despite that flowing blood, his expression was infinitely calm. The only things reflecting in his slow-moving pupils were his sword and the figure of his enemy. There was no hesitation. Quan. Silver petals fluttered. Chapter 33 Kigajijigig Quajik Hyung Shuyuk Lo's quillin was destroyed. The crossguard that protected the wearer's hand, at the joining of the blade and the hilt. As the axe slid against my sword, it destroyed the crossguard and swooped in. Had I been just a little late to react, my wrist would have been severed. He's not an opponent I can beat right now. I was breathing heavily, sweat dripping off my chin, but he wasn't. He looked no different than he did before the fight. That majestic figure, that unchanging expression, and that red hair of his. All were the same. Even the aura he emanated pricked the skin like needles. He's big. Not just his size. Even his axes were extraordinarily large. There was a clear gap between our skills. Predator sword, Lowe's screamed as cracks spread on its blade. Drip, drip. Blood seeped through Dexter's glove. The more I blocked my opponent's axes, the more my hands trembled. I was teetering on the verge of losing hold of my sword. Jig. I tore off some cloth near the forearm and wounded around my hand gripping Lowe's. Who? I raised my physical abilities to their limit by circulating more energy, sharpening my nerves to a well-honed edge. Chiang. Hung. Every time an axe of his collided with my sword, red dust rose off the blood-drenched earth, 
and shockwaves rippled through the air, making the skin tingle. Quan! Quan! My bones throbbed. Less than half of the divine power accumulated in the bracelet was left. That divine power, purified over a long period, has narrowed the gap between us a little, but that was all. There was a great moat between Callius the scapegrace and the great warrior Keltuk that could not be filled with just that. A great moat of experience and talent. A gap that could not be bridged so simply between the axe and the sword. At first glance, the contest looked even. The reality, however, was completely different. The dual axes had plenty of room to move. The great warrior could go a little faster, add a little more power. He could pierce or deflect Callius' sword at his leisure. However, he didn't do that, and just accepted his opponent's attacks, as if he was having fun. Chick, biting his lower lip, Callius changed his sword art. A subtle change that could not be felt unless one observed closely. The silver flower wave sword art was no longer the same as before. The sharp and smoothly traveling sword began to change as if numerous flower petals were blooming on it. Creating an illusion as if the sword had multiplied into dozens at once. The mystery of the silver flower wave sword art lies in mutability. Change is the essence of its existence. An art to dazzle and confuse opponents with its ever changing sword. A sword for the weak against the strong. The first sword deceives, and the second also. Deceive and deceive until you deceive even yourself, that is the art called the Silver Flower Wave Sword. Chan. Petals fluttered in the air. The divine power contained in the weapon had scattered, and were fluttering all around like flower petals. The petals hovering in the air attached themselves again to Callius' sword. The sword, that had been deflected, suddenly circled around and savagely struck again at the enemy's neck. SSSK, seeing the bloody sword tip piercing the air, the great warrior curved his lips. Sweek! Teeing! A violent shock erupted in his arms and then spread throughout his body. As he staggered at the shock, Callius' body flew through the air at another sudden impact. Cock! Blood splattered through the air. He had obviously been aiming for the neck. But suddenly, another axe had blocked his way, and Callius couldn't break through its strong defense. An obvious mistake. And that mistake in his sword would now demand death as its price. Keltuk's axe flew sharply towards Callius who'd been flung into the air at his kick. Quan. Lowe's, which had barely regenerated, broke again and flew into the sky. Chwak. A red line of blood appeared from Callius' right shoulder to his side. Kung. Kook. Red blood soaked the ground. Callius' lifeblood was unceasingly pouring down. I lost. The sky looked red. It brought a woman to mind. Red as the twilight. Ha! He fell down, exhaling a hot breath. The air he breathed in, however, was infinitely cold. The process was very simple. As you exhale the heat and inhale the cold, your body becomes colder and colder. The hot blood running through his body cooled down, calming his ambitions and aspirations. Tias. Callius, fallen on the ground, looked at great warrior staring down at him, standing tall with the red sky at his back. His gray pupils ran red with blood, and the fleeting moment seemed like an eternity. With each exhalation, hundreds of memories and regrets floated to the surface of his mind. But even so, time gradually passed, and it all sublimated to one single truth. Ah! Ah! His ears were almost deaf. The eardrums creaked as if they'd been filled with water. Nevertheless, one of his talents, Bard's blessing, ironically transmitted the sounds of despair to his eardrums. We're all going to die. I don't want to die. Ah! When Callius fell, the knights panicked. Those who had even the slightest wisdom realized that there was no point in running away and felt devastated, while those engulfed in fear ran and screamed foolishly. 
The great warrior's eyes frowned. Do you know no shame? The great warrior Kaltuk, who had never been marred by shame, threw his axes and killed those who tried to run away. He killed only those who had tried to disgracefully escape. Kaltuk snorted, then looked at Callius with satisfied eyes. An example of a rare warrior. Even though he knew he was going to die, he showed the best sword he could show. It wasn't something just anyone could do. To show the highest sword you can achieve despite knowing how high a wall you face. Even for animals, it was logical and instinctive to run away with the tail between their legs facing those stronger than themselves. Those who can rebel against that instinct are called warriors, and are to be revered. So the man deserved it. The same fate as an orc warrior. Keltuk thought so. So the great warrior Keltuk took up his axe. To show his final respect. The enemy's life must be cut off by his own hands. It was his last courtesy to the warrior who shall soon return to the embrace of the gods. Whying. That was then. Suddenly, Callius Aura changed. The light on his pupils disappeared, and a strange air began to linger around him. His breath, which had seemed like it would cease any moment, now came long and steady. Keltuk narrowed his eyes. Somehow, Callius suddenly had a box in his hand. It was unknown where he got it from, but the box was filled with divine energy. As soon as it opened, Keltuk took an involuntary step backwards. The divine power of a holy one not. The divine power of a saint. The pure power began to dominate the space all around. Inside the box was a sacred stone. A remnant of a saint. The reason he brought it out all of a sudden, was it a gift to Keltuk? He was bewildered for a moment. Giving a reward to the enemy who killed you. He was an enemy, but he was a man who could respect and acknowledge his opponent. However, that illusion did not last long. Gulp. Suddenly, Callius ate the sacred stone. A creepy sensation. An unfamiliar feeling of uneasiness swept through Keltuk's whole being. He immediately raised his axe. Dangerous. Eating the sacred stone shouldn't have changed anything. However, unlike his reason, his instinct was shouting that he should not leave it be. Come. 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 Keltuk quickly approached Callius. And when the axe was about to strike, Quan! Keltuk's eyes lit up and dimmed down. The flowing north wind cooled the heat from the air. A thunderbolt carried by the north wind was blocking his axe. Quan! This! He was one step late. Bernard had flown to hear from Javarsh on the northern winds, using the thunderbolt sword, Rockin. He didn't even have the time to worry about landing. And as it turned out, there really was no time. Callius, this idiot bastard. He couldn't stand to look at the sight. Bernard's anger erupted from the tip of his sword. Quajajijik. Quakwang. Rockin, the blue thunderbolt engulfed the surroundings. A huge explosion resounded. Cock. Keltuk gave an echoing groan as he was struck by the bolt of thunder. The orc immediately lifted his axe high into the sky and struck the ground. Quan! Jijijijijik! The ground cracked and broke, chunks of rock jumping into the air. Whirlick! Bernard, who had turned sideways to avoid the flying debris, slashed them all down with his sword, and picked up Callius before throwing him away. Emily! Take him and run away. Grandpa. Don't worry about me. We must save him. You must save him. Ah, okay. Bruns. Leave it to me. Ha. Huh. That was then. Callius stood right back up. Blood still poured out from his wounds. His face was bloodless and his lips blue, as if he could die any moment but for some reason, his eyes were clear. Master. No. Callius pushed Bruns away and staggered forward. His destination was the life sword, Lucen, 
which he had stabbed into the ground before the fight started. Lowe's was broken, but he still had one more sword to try. That didn't mean listen. Crazy. Why are you doing that? Don't you even care about your own life, you idiot. Callius looked into the air. The gluttony characteristic is digesting the sacred stone. Absorbing the sacred stone. Unable to fully absorb. Absorbing. Messages scrolled down one after another, and his body was pounding. I feel hazy. But my senses are clear. It was a strange state of being. The mind is hazy, but the senses are clear. Although I have no strength in my body, everything around me seems strangely clear, as if I am seeing it all with my own eyes and hearing it all with my own ears. As if every single point in space is so near and intimate that I could touch them if I just reached out with my hands. Is it the characteristic of death versus composition? The characteristic that brings enlightenment at the doorstep of death? I swallow the sacred stone. It wasn't something I had planned beforehand. It was something instinctive. But that's why I'm able to move like this right now. The gluttony characteristic. That is digesting the sacred stone that you couldn't normally. And absorb its power. It was an unexpected idea from his original perspective. A reckless and opportunistic trick. However, that kept him alive. The sacred stone has been incompletely absorbed. Six peak flowers bloom in late season has risen to the second star. Ha! Callius, who had absorbed the divine power of a saint, felt as if all the energy flowing around him could now be caught in his eyes. Whether this was temporary or permanent, he knew one thing. Six peak flowers bloom in late season rose to the second star. The quality of divine power increased. So, what did a second star mean? Callius didn't know, exactly. His head was dizzy, and strange lights kept flashing in front of his eyes. However, the new bud in his elixir field calmed his heart. Chwak! The blooming second peak exuded a divine power that was quite different from the first. And it kept absorbing power at the same time. The divine power of the sacred stone Callius had devoured. And by absorbing all that external divine power, it built and refined itself. Is it? His wounds were bleeding so much it wouldn't be strange if he keeled over and died any moment. Even so, Callius thought while holding Listen. Now I know. How to put the divine power into the sword. Keen. Listen's keening resonance echoed through the earth. Dust spread around Callius, and pure divine power enveloped him in silver light. His eyes saw Listen turn red, then gradually gray, then blue. Tricolor I. Correct the mistakes in the trajectory of the sword due to your lack of talent, using the tricolor I. In this way, it is possible to implement the techniques of the silver flower wave sword art that could not be used before. Silver flower wave sword, white haze, one. The name was given because of how the strange sword technique resembled a vague white expanse in others' eyes. White haze. It bloomed on Callius' blade. Strange sword strikes that seemed to be dancing through smoke. And soon. Kung. He stepped forward with his left foot. Dust spread out in a circle, and a strange energy began to dominate the area. The white haze blooms on the earth. The resplendent yet mysterious sword skill deceived the opponent's eyes and pierced through the ground. Quajijijik. The white haze spread out like ice crystals in all directions, and soon the silver mists turned into sword energy and burst out from beneath the ground. Quan, As a circle of ten paces centered on Callius exploded with the power of the silver flower wave sword, Bernard and Keltuk were busy retreating. However, their complexions were distinctly different. Where did you learn this? And where are you going? As if he had recognized the power of the sword skill at a glance, Bernard tied Keltuck down as the latter tried to run away. If his disciple was unleashing such an ultimate skill with all his might, Bernard couldn't let that be all in vain. His thunderbolt sword struck. 
Pajijijik. Kuon. Crack. Keltuk's axe, which had been trying to block the thunderbolt sword, flew away. Kalia's silver flower wave sword burst out from the ground, and this time Keltuk could not evade. Sasasasak. He slashed at all the sword petals with his remaining axe, but his skin still gradually cracked, and blood began to pour out of his body. Chwak. To do do duck. He had no way to block all the silver flower wave sword petals indiscriminately rushing at him. Ka. Seeing Keltuk screaming in pain, Callius stepped forward once more. I can do it now. Just like when I fought Esther. The silver flower wave sword petals collect into a single point, scrape and crush the opponent's sword, and make it their own. Not just breaking it, even reversing its power and turning it into an attack. The petals fluttered like furious waves. As if each petal in the shape of a sword had its own will. His gray eyes gleamed with silver. His jet black hair shone silver as well. Silver flower wave sword, raging flower wave, two, dot. Scatter and condense. The petals converge into one. Like waves slowly rushing in together. Into one great, furious storm. And right now, such a legendary sword skill unfolded in Callius' hands. Quaia. A storm of flower blades swept through the area. Chapter 34 Emily doubted her own eyes. No, rather, she simply couldn't believe what she'd seen. It's crazy. What kind of swordsmanship did the biggest trash in Gervain's history show her? The swordsmanship of the legendary Saint Stella, of whom songs were still sung. The art called the Silver Flower Wave Sword. Petals danced in the air, and he painted colorful flowers in the wind with his sword. Petals hovered all around him, moving with his sword according to his desire. Gradually condensing and gathering their strength, a wave of petals attacked the enemy like a surging tide. The power it boasted at that moment was like a raging storm. As if it was the north wind itself. The ground was filled with scars from those petals, a memento of that sword's passing. How could such a phenomenon be caused by only a sword? Emily couldn't believe it when she saw it. Especially since the one who caused it was Gervain's scapegrace. Especially since it was Callius von Gervain. Ha, 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 ha. But even that was now over. Callius' breathing became heavy. His spirit power, which had burned with such resplendent divinity, was also scattering. It was because he had poured most of his energy into that single sword. The Great Warrior The form of the Great Warrior was nowhere to be found. Seeing that Bernard was sheathing his sword, unfortunately, he seemed to have run away. But even that was a great achievement. Fighting and defeating a great orc warrior, one strong enough to lead an entire corps. Tuck. The sword dropped from his grip, and his body followed, helplessly falling down. Blood began again pouring out again from his chest. Emily's eyes widened to the size of saucers. Mia. Bronze. Emily rushed forward. If you just leave him like that, Callius will surely die. No matter even if he swallowed a sacred stone, he'd shed far too much blood. Drip, drip. His blood pooled on the barren ground. Emily's face contorted. Oh, master. Ah, uh, what should we do? I don't know. I need to heal the wound somehow, but I can't. He's already bled too much. He may not survive even if the wound heals, and there is no medicine on hand to heal it. Grandfather. Let me see. There was one answer, but Bernard had no way to achieve it. It could be done if they could reach Javarsh, but this place was too far. Judging from his condition, Callius would most like pass away on the way. Bernard, who had experienced such a scene many times in his old age, knew that. The wrinkles on his forehead deepened. There is no choice but to pray to God. O oh, great God, Valtherus! Your son is in danger. 
the sword already showed us the potential to one day fulfill your wish, so please don't throw him away. As everyone prayed. Hey, I have a way. It was bronze. He rummaged through his bag like a man possessed, and pulled out a vial with trembling hands. What is this? My dash, master, made this medicine. He gave me one of these and told me to use it in case he lost consciousness, or if I thought he was going to die. Emily snatched it away before he could even finish speaking. How, how do I apply it? You just pour it on the wound, or feed it. Emily immediately opened the stopper of the vial, poured half its contents over the wound, and the rest into Callius' mouth. Then she hugged him and wept. Don't die. You can't die now. We only just met, so why are you trying to die already? Bernard stroked Emily's back with pitying eyes, and ordered the knights gathered around him. You lot depart for Javarsh. He's at the crossroads between life and death, so we'll have to hide in the forest nearby and see how it goes. Callius was in critical condition, so they could not move him hastily, but there is no need for a large group of people to remain here. We will stay together. But the knights shook their heads. Earlier, they had not run away, but accepted their death. And yet they lived, because of Callius, so they had no desire to run away again and preserve their own lives. That's right. Ha <laughs> ha. Seeing them following Callius despite the circumstances, Bernard felt his mood improve. But seeing Callius' bloodless appearance again, it didn't last long. Then let's change the place. Soon after, the party moved to avoid the next wave of the orcs. Tick, tick. I woke up to the pleasant sound of a bonfire. The ceiling looked like that of a cabin made of dark wood. Kig. As I tossed and turned, the bed groaned. Um. Emily was sleeping on her stomach by the bed. On the other side, a red-lit fireplace illuminated the lodge. As I was about to get up, I saw Emily still sleeping, so I lay back down. I pondered over what had happened. There was no memory loss. Fortunately, I remembered everything. Still lying down on the bed, I stretched my hand upwards. Cut. With this hand. That swordsmanship had been almost unconscious, but I remembered the sensation of having cut. But I don't know just where I cut. I had been conscious, and the memory remained clear, but I hadn't been sane or rational at that moment. But I got him, for sure. So he ran away. I feel bad. If I had bagged the great warrior, the quest reward, as well as the rank of the carcass made of his remains, would have been something to behold. There was the bitter taste of regret on my tongue, but then I laughed it off. I who was about to die, came back to life. Desiring even more on top of that is pure avarice. Just surviving the great warrior was enough for lifetime bragging rights, when it came to the other knights. Hmm. Did Bruns use the holy water? The wound that ran from the shoulder down to the side was healing smoothly. It was a pretty deep wound, so it hadn't fully healed yet, but it was safe to say that the rest was just a matter of time. It wasn't a wound that could be healed so neatly without using holy water, so it seemed that the one prepared beforehand had been used. Then I now have four left. I'd kept all the holy water in Eldora's cloth bag, except for the one vial I gave Bruns just in case. After all, shouldn't you consider all the possibilities and prepare contingencies? Otherwise, if I ever fell unconscious and almost died, there'd be no way to use the holy water hidden in the stigma. When Bruns comes, I must praise him. This time, he really deserved praise. But I don't know why this kid is doing this. Emily. Seeing her sleeping so soundly, I felt pity for some reason. She can't be Elberton's daughter. There was no route that would have allowed Elberton to have such a young daughter. If so, then she had to be adopted. Was there any reason for Elberton to adopt a child whose divine blood was blocked? I didn't think so. So, how and why did Emily become Elberton's adopted daughter? There was no way to know which Gervain's blood she inherited. 
Is she my daughter? No way. Emily was 12 and Callius 26, so he would have needed to have a child when he was just 14. Well, if it's Callius we're talking about, it's not impossible. I never set something like that up. However you think about it, there's no answer. Why is Bernard taking care of this child? That was then. Keeg. Are you awake? The door opened, and a man with cropped and frail gray hair entered through it. A paladin, with a physique that belied his ears. It was Bernard. Yes. I wasn't too surprised because I already knew it was him. If I widened my aura sense a little further, I could even feel the presence of many knights, stationed near this mountain hut. How long have I been asleep? About four days. Does that mean the moment has already passed? I've delayed too long. In four days, the orcs must have already arrived near Javarsh. I don't have time to laze around like this. I carefully got up from the bed, grabbing the leather armor and gear neatly organized nearby. Didn't you just wake up? There's no rush, so rest now. There's no time for that. My wounds are already healing, and above all else, is this the time to rest? Bernard shut his mouth at my words. A deep sigh ripped out of him, filled with anguish. What's the situation now? I don't know all the details. But I do know that the orcs have reached the castle. Did they start? No, not yet. It seemed like the war hadn't yet started properly. Thank God. It was not yet too late. We had to leave right now. Callius. What? After lightly responding to Bernard, I strapped Lowe's and loosened to my waist. Every time I moved, my wounds throbbed, but it was tolerable. The power of the holy water still remained inside me, and it slowly healed me even if I moved around. Cheek. Callius, wearing the cloak of twilight, looked at Bernard and then at the sleeping form of Emily. Bernard's expression was unusual. What's going on? You look as nervous as a dog about to shit, one. Is that how you talk? Grumbling about how Callius was one rotten bastard, Bernard glared at Emily and asked quietly. This war will be fiercer than you think, and it will be a battlefield that no one can surely survive. Of course, there will be many moments where your life is at risk, and the same for me as well. What is this old man babbling about? I crouched, folded my arms, and listened quietly to what Bernard had to say. So, you stay here. Why is that? I saw you fighting the great warrior. I thought you were honing something strange, but I didn't expect it to be Stella's swordsmanship. Then, Shouldn't that be a reason for me to participate in the war even more? No, that's why you shouldn't step into this battlefield anymore. What's the problem? I don't know how you learn the Silver Flower Wave Sword, but as long as you can master that sword, then you are no longer a simple pilgrim, nor are you the scapegrace of Gervain. To summarize, Bernard told me. Callius. Go to the church. Go and show them your sword to publicize the Silver Flower Wave Sword art. Didn't you suffer because you were kicked out of your family during that time? There were many times when you almost died. Even now, you came back from the very precipice of death. You don't have to suffer like this. Hmm. I knew what Bernard meant. You don't have to go through any trouble. There is no need to risk dying. Just by spreading the swordsmanship, Carpe and Valthorus can become stronger. That was to say. By doing so, the church will recognize Callius, and Carpe, as well as Gervain, will also recognize him. Are you serious? Bernard's eyes were serious. He was being sincere. He said these words only thinking of myself. But what do you know? He had no idea. What is my purpose? What are the risks looming ahead? I refuse. It's not worth hearing him out any further. The reason? There are many. Beasts. Magic born, too. 
Empire. Pagans. Krasian. Demons. There are countless dangers in my path. To survive such things, I have to raise my own power. You can't achieve anything if you just hide under the skur of the church or the state. Even if you can, it's only temporary. On the pilgrim's path, the only way Callius could survive was to pick up a sword. The only path. I am. Bernard waited patiently for my answer. Pondering what to say, finally I spat out the obvious. I am a pilgrim. A pilgrim in search of his sword till the end of his life. Yes. Before being a noble. Before even being a disciple of Bernard. I was a pilgrim. That's right. That's right, isn't it? Bernard smiled bitterly, apologizing as if he had made a mistake. Forget it. I forgot that you were a pilgrim for a while. Yes, a pilgrim's duty is to find his sword. His beloved sword. He caressed Rockin's handle and smirked. Then where's your sword? Fatalite's wheel. Number of orcs killed, 172. Number of beasts killed, 86. Number of people saved, 41. Reward, A. Dash. In response to his question, I raised an eyebrow and answered, Where else? On the wheel. The ever turning wheel of my pilgrimage. My sword shall be at the end of that road. Chapter 35 A long way away from the village. Two men dressed in black robes stood before an orc covered in blood. One had a spear on his back. Another held an old wooden staff in his hand. Raging flower wave. Sword marks left by a sweeping storm of flower petals. The man with the staff had an empty gaze as if reminiscing of a time long past, when he had last seen the traces of those furious waves. To think I'll be able to see Stella's sword again one day. Life really can play some absurd jokes on you. Master Ramatu. Why did you let them go? Because flowers that are about to bloom are beautiful. The man carrying the spear on his back pulled back his hood, uncovering his face. An imposingly handsome man with blonde hair. He was Luthien, the apostate. I even risked my life for this mission. If those dozens of knights and the paladin that you spared become a factor that causes the failure of this mission, I shall hold even Ramatu of Krasian to account. Ramatu shrugged. If you can, try it. Ramatu of Krasian. One of the representative figures of Krasian, said to have lived for centuries. He was not a human, but an old monster. Luthien clicked his tongue. So, why did you save this orc? Keltuk is someone who knows me well. It was a pity to leave him to die. Wasn't it? Saying so, he tapped the orc with his staff. The orc jerked and screamed. Why did you interfere in a fight between warriors? The orc's roars were mixed with rage. His face and chest were deeply wounded, bleeding red. However, that did not quell his anger at being interrupted in the midst of battle. What do you mean by this, Ramatu? Why did you interrupt my battle? The man with a staff called Ramatu shook his head. Great warrior Keltuk. This is not yet your time to die. You had made such a contract. I apologize for besmirching the honor of a warrior, but there was nothing else I could do. Are we not bound by the same pact? Brooding on those words for a moment, Keltuk raised his axe making rivulets of blood flow down from his face and chest. The moment the spear-bearer tried to raise his own spear to warn him. Come! Tuck! Kellyula look! Kel Tuck groaned in pain as he severed one of his own arms. This savage barbarian! What? Why, his arm? To flee a battle is to be marred by shame, so he must show respect to his opponent and punish himself. Such was the orc's way of life. Tongue. As the black-robed man struck the ground with his staff, blood gushed out as if the earth was alive. And soon, it covered the exposed cross-section where the orc had severed his arm, 
joining it with his axe, and hardened. Luthien. What happened to the attack on Gervain? It must have failed. They were just bait, anyway. The day he shows a fatal gap in his defense shall be the day he dies. Elberton. I don't know if his head will fall off that easily. Try hard. Aren't you going to help? I think I've done enough by bringing in the orcs. Creation simply pays others back in their own coin. Be it grace or revenge. Tass. As Ramada disappeared in the space of an instant, Luthien looked in the direction where Callius had been. Callius. You too, were a Gervain. That's just the way of the world. For a time, Luthien thought of the sword he had in his mind. Then he, too, disappeared. Kig. After his conversation with Bernard, Callius left the hut and looked around at the makeshift camp. Seven died fleeing the great warrior. The survivors now numbered in the thirties or so. Master Callius. Callius is awake. Prince Callius. Alan and Aaron as well as the rest of the nameless knights and soldiers, came running like children. Are you all right? Oh, you were so seriously hurt, but already. That's too. Callius. Remember this night, Lenin. I did not flee. Pilgrim. Your body. Callius ignored the chattering knights and called Bruns. Bruns. Yes, master. He. Callius patted him on the shoulder. Bruns, fearing being hit, couldn't suppress his flinch. Callius' hand, which had been raised for another pat on the shoulder, drooped down. Get ready. Where are we going? Don't ask the obvious. Their destination was the Gervain Castle. Javarsh. But you haven't recovered yet. Bruns looked at the knights and said cautiously. It's not that Callius didn't understand what he meant, but he really didn't have time. By now, three or four days had already passed as he rested, so it was even more urgent. He had to go kill the orcs and stop the darkness of this war, in order to complete the quest and increase the level of rewards. The wheel still spins. And along with this wheel, Callius' future was also in flux. Despite facing a path covered in thorns, he had no choice but to march forward. Callius glanced back. Behind the cloak of twilight fluttering in the wind, the knights following him had determination on their faces. Not bad. Callius was very pleased with the appearance of the knights following him. Although, since they hadn't eaten or washed for a while, the sight of that bloody and limping procession was quite terrifying at first glance. Callius. Alan could be seen from afar. He was leading a horse with a bright face. I found you a horse. Alan grinned like a child asking for praise. That appearance wasn't very knightly, so Callius almost burst out laughing. Good work. It was a brown horse with a shiny mane and medium physique. You can ride it. You're not too well yet, so you can ride this guy all the way to Javarsh. Alan, you bastard, wherever you go, you're just trying to score points. I just got lucky. Ha ha ha. Keep pretending. Callius was troubled by the friendly atmosphere among the knights. Callius was no horseman. The original Callius, who had no talent in anything, could neither swing a sword nor ride a horse. He who had become the current Callius had also been a modern urbanite, so he wasn't familiar with horse riding either. He had had the chance to ride horses before. However, there were repeated failures. Should I try? It might be a little different now. But there was still one thing to worry about. If I failed again, it would. No matter how high your noble bloodline, if you can't deal with a single horse, what kind of shame is that? Callius looked at Alan and the knights with their eyes twinkling in anticipation, pretending to be casual. Hmm. And immediately drew the sword from his waist. Sook. Come. Ugh. Oh no, Master Callius. Callius decapitated the horse. With a single slash. 
the horse died without even knowing how. That's how sharp and fierce his sword was. Most of the knights could only see him start drawing his sword and then finish putting it back in its scabbard. His sword was so fast that they felt as if the intermediate process had been omitted. His swordsmanship was more refined than before and had risen to a higher level. C.A. Dash, Master Callius. Why, didn't you like my gift? For some reason, Alan started weeping. Since the horse he gave as a gift was killed in front of his eyes, he wondered if he'd done something wrong. Just as he was contemplating how to ask for forgiveness from Callius. Master is just rewarding the knights who've stood by him. You haven't slept or eaten well for so long, so have one good meal, can't you understand something so simple? It was bronze. His useless meddling was being helpful for once. Callius nodded. You're being so considerate. I didn't even think of that. I was stupid and couldn't understand what Master Callius meant. I'm so sorry. Okay, let's prepare to eat. Yes. The knights immediately began carving out the horse, draining its blood and skinning it. Come to think of it, I should take a walk too. Patting his own stomach, Callius headed for the forest. Where are you going? With around thirty heads, a single horse can't even fill a corner of our bellies. It's better to go and hunt a few more wild beasts. If you find a magic beast, you can feed its blood to Lowe's to make it recover. I'll go with you. All right. Callius walked into the forest with bronze. Plucking a leaf of grass from nearby, he made a grass flute and blew it. Musical notes danced in the wind. As they walked, they cut down an oncoming deer and then a wild boar, one by one. Bruns flattered him saying he sounded great, while happily bundling up the carcasses and putting them into Eldora's cloth bag. Yeah, I really am. What do you mean? There's a sign of a demonic beast. Hide. Yes, yep. Callius placed Lusen back onto his waist and drew Lowe's just as the demonic beast appeared. Lowe's was pulled out and swung in a single movement, intersecting with the form rushing out from the bushes. Chwank. Callius, who had split the wolf-shaped beast into two, looked at the sword in his hand with surprise. What? This. The sword, which had been broken so recently, showed off a blade much more pristine than he'd expected. Aside from the fact that the regular patterns engraved on the blade still remained, it was impossible to think of it as the same sword as earlier, since the blade now shined crimson, as if bathed in blood. When did you change? Was it after it was broken? Or was it after I lost my mind? He didn't know for sure, but Callius was still happy. Why? Predator Sword, Lowe's. Grade, Spirit Sword. Inhabited Soul, a Mixed Soul the test subject that was the culmination of Rogerus research. Although it was the last chimera Rogerus created, it was turned into a sword by Callius von Gervain. Unique Ability, Predation Because the Predator Sword, Lowe's had finally risen to the rank of a spirit sword. The red blade, which symbolized a spirit sword, shone brighter and more beautiful than any other light. The stench of blood had deepened, but the power of the sword itself had increased significantly enough to more than offset that. I knew it. Lowe's became a spirit sword. You'd know it as soon as you grab the sword. As soon as a true expert grasps his sword, he can tell its state and level, and Callius could feel it a little bit. The impact of cutting the beast just now was negligible. The fact that the body of the beast was split in twain and yet the impact of the cut had been negligible meant the blade was incredibly sharp. Callius's grip on the hilt tightened. This will do. Great warrior Keltuk was still alive. In the fight against him, he'd felt the desperate need for a spirit sword. What if there hadn't been a sacred stone in his hands, or he hadn't had the trait to absorb it? What if Bernard hadn't shown up in the nick of time? What if the orc hadn't leisurely enjoyed their battle? Even the enlightenment of death verse composition, one, wouldn't have been enough to save Callius from his doom. 
it was originally a fight with long odds. Even so, there was a not insignificant regret in the corners of his heart. If only he had a spirit sword, he wouldn't have been toyed with so easily. The quality of my divine power also increased. And now there was even a spirit sword in his hand. Now, he was no longer afraid to fight the great orc warrior, Keltuk. Rather, he felt anticipation. Six peak flowers bloom in late season, and silver flower wave sword, raging flower wave. It had even become possible to use the second martial skill, too, white haze. The skills were still unstable, but the level of his divine power had increased, and his vessel, three, had also grown, so the next battle won't be as one-sided as before. The next time we meet, I will turn him into my sword. Chapter 36 Callius? Callius, is that you? I was wandering around looking for beasts to test Lowe's out on a bit more. When I heard a certain name, I looked around and saw a gaggle of knights approaching, led by one with dark hair and gray eyes. Who is it? While I was bewildered, the one at the forefront spoke to me with a smile. I'd hope to meet you here. Callius. Don't you remember me? It's Zornik. Don't say you can't remember Zornik, the mighty. Zornik. I remembered hearing it somewhere. Callius' memories flashed through my head in an instant. Zornik von Gervain. A knight of Gervain famed for his inborn supernatural might. One of Callius' cousins. A named in most roots. You're the one who loved to stamp on Callius. Zornik was three years older than Callius, and they'd grown up together since childhood. But he was often dissatisfied with the gap between the collateral family lines and the direct one. So, knowingly or unknowingly, he often insulted or slandered Callius while pretending to be friendly. He had a record of breaking Callius' arm using a practice duel as an excuse, so their relationship was pretty much the worst. However, their respective reputations were poles apart, so Callius could only be humiliated by Zornik every time. It's not my own memory, but it's still annoying. Because he was a source of trauma for Callius, my judgment became complicated. My eyes kept falling down and my hair beat was erratic. Regardless of my own intentions, I kept making these gestures. A combination of Callius' instinctive rejection and fear for the man in front of me. It's been a long time. How sad I was that you left the family. Ignoring Zornik's attempt at a handshake, I put my left hand on Lucen's handle. Behind him were the knights of Gervain who followed him. About ten people. He wasn't on a horse, and seeing them here in the forest, they seemed to be carrying out a separate mission. What's going on? Ah, you're being so cold. I'm here on the order of the Patriarch. Hey, hey, there's no need to be so on guard. It's just us here. It's tough. Because my body was that of Callius. Interacting with Zornik was particularly awkward. I didn't really like his friendly tone, or his relaxed behavior. Rather, I felt an impulse to pull out Lowe's and turn him into a sword and then break that sword and throw it into a mound of shit. T T T. But the war was about to begin in earnest. There was nothing to be gained from killing him. Zornik was still lacking, but as time passed, he would become a strong knight for the north, and for Carpe. Considering the future, it was better to spare him. It's no big deal. As you know, the overall situation is not that good, so the Patriarch told me to come find Master Bernard as soon as possible. Bernard? Were the family head and Bernard that close? This was my first time hearing this. I'd never heard of a route where the family head and Bernard get closer, but this world was not just a game. Do you know where Master Bernard is? Follow me. He must want to take Bernard with him to Javarsh then there's no reason to hide. It was quite awkward dealing with Zernik, but it would be safer to accompany him, because who knew what kind of danger lurked on the path to Javarsh. Yeah, I'm glad. I came here looking for traces of Master Bernard, 
but the trail was cut off here at this mountain. But to think I'll meet you here. I could feel him stroking his chin and looking at me with strange eyes. His gaze moved up and down, scanning me from head to toe. It was kind of creepy. I heard that you became a pilgrim, but your strength hasn't changed that much compared to when you were young. It's because of the artifact. Most of the spirit power that had risen to level 3 was absorbed by the bracelet. If not, he would have felt it right away. However, there were thorns hidden in his words. Something like, even if you've become a pilgrim, you're still at the same level as when you were young. Knights measure an opponent's strength by their aura. Roughly, the magnitude of the spiritual force. So, that was to say. He's looking down on me. It was only natural. Somebody who had been tormenting you since childhood became a pilgrim and you two met by chance, but there was no difference in his strength? Naturally, he treated the other as somebody inferior to him, and behaved in a relaxed manner. How have you been? Still, when we were young, I called you bro. Why are you so cold to me now, bro? Tuck, tuck. He lightly punched me in the shoulder with his fist but there's a difference between being relaxed and being rude. I felt that this needed to be emphasized. So, I broke his arm. Hey, hey. Callius. It hurts, dude. Zornik still had a smile on his face, but the aura he exuded told a different story. His eyes were bloody, and his momentum sharp as a needle, as if he would draw his sword any moment. Zornik and I stopped, still on the forest path. Bruns, as well as the knights following Zornik, became serious. The knights grasped the hilts of their swords, and Bruns also grabbed his dagger and kept a close eye on the situation. I don't know if it's an effect of Callius' personality or an effect of the trait. But whatever it was, I was very angry right now. Callius' memories. Those emotions make my blood boil. It had been a very long time. It felt like I'd gone back to the time when I was still the maniac of Gervain. So, I couldn't stand it. Keying. My sword was vibrating as if to escape its scabbard. The flow of air. Zornik's pulse. Time slowed down to the ponderous speed of a glacier. My sword sprang forwards, along the optimal path, pointing towards the neck of the man opposite me. The first destination was his carotid artery. The ultimate goal was to cut off this bastard's head. During that brief instant, the peak flower in my elixir field doubled my strength, and that pure divine power flowed through Lo's generating sword energy. Like the petals had huddled together, it was a strange sword. However, this was still the silver flower wave sword art. One wouldn't notice its sharpness unless they observed closely but it had enough destructive power to destroy even the sword of the opponent. Look out! Ching! The throbbing feeling running down his fingertips made Callius' lips twitch. Fragments of sword energy fluttered around him like petals. His sword had been blocked. But it wasn't Zornik's sword that did so. Unlike his red sword, the other sword that once surrounded by blue lightning. Thunderbolt sword, Rockin'. It was Bernard's sword. Callius. Stop playing around. How old are you now? He'd drawn a sword like lightning. Yet, Callius Lowe's was blocked by Bernard before it could reach Zornik's neck. TTT, Callius clicked his tongue and spat out a senseless excuse. I just wanted to check my skills once. He wondered how this old man had known to arrive just in time. Dururuk. Tack. Callius, who had sheathed Lowe's, seemed to have lost interest, and headed back towards the smell of grilled meat wafting from the camp. You, too, come along. There should be enough for a spoonful, ha. Ah. Bernard couldn't help but smile when he saw a bead of sweat on Zornik's face. Near the hut, the knights were busy grilling meat and making soup. They were also cutting wood to make the bowls and the cutlery and everyone was running around in a hurry. Callius. You're back? Your food's already done, Master Callius. Have a seat here. 
Callias. Where have you been? Why did you not tell me where you were going? Well, Bruns. Here I am, master. Don't ignore me. After pushing away the nagging Emily, Callias was handed a knife and fork and started eating the horse meat in a refined manner. Not bad. Callias just kept ignoring Emily's endless chatter. And amongst all that, there was a man looking at him with strange eyes. Zornik, of Gervain. It was Zornik von Gervain. I can feel that his aura hasn't changed much from before. That instant when Callias had explosively drawn his sword was still etched vividly in his mind. Zornik grabbed the bowl of soup handed to him with one hand, and stroked his neck with the other. If Master Bernard hadn't stopped him. Gulp. The hair that had stood up on the back of his neck still showed no sign of calming down. Besides, the power that broke his wrist the first time. That strength, too, was quite different from before. Did it mean that the guy who had been a hothouse flower all his childhood had now become a full-fledged swordsman? Still, if it's a proper fight, I'll win. He was called the Zornik the Mighty. To be honest, he only got so flustered because he had no idea that Callius would suddenly draw the sword in the first place. However, in a proper fight, would Callius be able to handle his inborn supernatural might? Zornik had overcome many crises throughout his life with his inborn supernatural might. He was proud of it as his shining brilliance. And, born of Gervain's bloodline, he also took special pride in swordsmanship. If we fight again. Zornik's eyes narrowed. He looked at the pair of swords laid down on the root of a nearby tree. A medium-sized broadsword, one, and a giant greatsword. They were the swords used by Zornik, who was proud of his inborn physical might. He could use either of them to crush most other swords with simple strong force. They were swords that he'd normally be proud of, except... Callias. His sword was red and marked with strange patterns. The sword itself had a strange shape, but it was definitely a red sword. A pilgrim would never dare carry such a sword just to show off. A spirit sword. The meaning of that red blade must be that the sword's spirit has awakened. Greed flashed in Zornik's eyes. Teacher. Now you call me teacher. After finishing their meals, Callias and Bernard made their way through the woods, quietly conversing while they watched Zornik move ahead. He was looking at my sword with covetous eyes. I know. But that's expected from a swordsman. You, too, coveted my rockin. Rockin is my sword anyhow. This crazy guy. Bernard clicked his tongue and then shook his head. Well, but it can't be helped. I don't know about before, but things are different now. The road to Javarsh would be very different from before. A large army of orcs would be blocking their way, so if you made a single mistake, you might get caught by your ankles and drown in enemies. So, the more people there were, the better, and Zornik's mission to come find Bernard was issued by the family head. Since it was an order from Count Gervain, they couldn't just tell him to go back, and there was no profit in sending him back. And in this kind of situation, will he really try to take your sword? It's not like you don't know this, but you wave your sword around like a crazed murderer. Whose side are you on? What I mean is that you have a real hair trigger temper. That was really rude, but Callias had to admit there was a little truth to it. It was difficult for him to hold back his rage when memories of the past came to his mind. If we go to Javarsh, it wouldn't end with just this. Javarsh was the centerpiece of all of Callias' trauma. And if the traits of a maniac scapegrace and an aristocrat acted in concert, things were only going to get worse. Affected by his traits and his trauma, he'd really behave like a maniac. Callias hated Javarsh from the bottom of his heart. Teacher. What is it this time? What do you think happens when a maniac gets his hands on power? Then he will not be a maniac anymore. If not a maniac, then what? Then what? He will become an icon. Icon? Have you finally gone senile in your old age? 
do you become an icon just because you're strong? Old age, ha. Huh? Hey, you idiot. Think about it a little. If you cut off one or two heads, you're just a murderer, but if you take hundreds or thousands of lives with your sword, what are you? A mass murderer? No. People will throw stones at murderers, but when you become a killer at that large a scale, they will be terrified. Fear alone will become a powerful force that will make them admire you. If it goes on a little further, the name of the killer will become enshrined in legend. If the killer's sword is directed at a common enemy, he will no longer be called a killer, but a hero. This is usually the case with war heroes. So, if you can, try and become a hero. If that happens, even if you kill hundreds of knights like that Zornik, there will be no one to badmouth you. Are you really a teacher? You're encouraging your disciple to kill someone. And here I was giving this warfroach some honest advice. Callius raised the corners of his lips, with a rare sense of satisfaction. I don't know what you're planning, but whatever you do, wait for the right time. The war in the north has just begun. Yes, I will. And exactly four days later, Callius beheaded Zornik. Chapter 37 Why Yying? The north wind, as always, scoured all in its path without discrimination. The dry wind blew away the shallow snow, creating small vortices that dissipated swiftly in the air. However, on the snow left on the frozen ground that the wind could not scour. Come! Orc footprints had been engraved. A castle with sturdy gray walls stood in the path of the orc army. Javarsh, built like an iron fortress, denied them passage. Soldiers and knights stood atop the wall, facing off the orcs arrayed below. Their gazes were heavy with murderous intent. The confrontation had entered a quiet lull, like the calmness before a storm. But the tension in the air continued unabated, like a taut bowstring. Not yet. Observing that the war hadn't broken out yet, Callius folded his telescope and put it away. Why are you looking at me like that? I told you to become a hero, not to become a murderer. I cut him down to become a hero. You couldn't rein in your temper and killed somebody, and now you say it was to become a hero. Was that why I taught you swordsmanship? It's not that I couldn't rein in my temper. He kept provoking me, and in the end, he even asked for a sword duel. Callius agreed to the duel, and the result was. A new sword now hung from his waist. The sword's name was Zornik. Named in honor of the recently deceased Zornik. Poor guy. And I didn't learn my swordsmanship from you, old teacher. Sometimes I'm afraid of you. Bernard shook his head. Actually, I'm often surprised by my own talent. You mean your talent for murder? In the current situation, a talent for killing seems quite fitting. In response to Callius' playful reply, Bernard took the pipe out of his sleeves. Taking Rockin' out from its scabbard, he lit the pipe with a lightning spark. Soon, the acrid smoke of tobacco began wafting out. Are you trying to send a signal to our enemies that you're here? This much doesn't even count, you bastard. I know better than you how great the orc's sense of smell is. Callius, speechless, looked around. Bruns was following at his back. Emily, Alan, Aaron, and the other knights were all lined up behind. The number was about forty. Including the knights who had followed Zornik. But it was a fair duel, wasn't it? You didn't have to kill him. It doesn't matter as long as I kill more orcs to make up for his share. Wasn't he still a relative, even if distant? No idea. Is that something the family scapegrace should care about? This time, Bernard was at a loss for words. Callius rolled his eyes at his unbelieving gaze. To be honest, there was nothing to be sorry about. The other party began the argument first, and he only fought because he asked for a duel. To be honest, he didn't even need to kill the guy but somehow or other it just happened that way. Maybe I did get a bit overheated. I have some regrets too. Zornik. 
Grade, Life Sword. Inhabited Soul, Zornik von Gervain. A bloodline descendant of the Gervain family's collateral branch. A promising knight called Zornik the Mighty, due to the innate physical strength that he showed from a young age. However, after losing his life in a duel with Callius von Gervain, he became a sword. If only I'd killed him after he grew up a bit more, he might have been able to reach the spirit sword stage. Was it because he got killed before he fully bloomed? The carcass of Zornik did not rise to the ranks of spirit swords. I'm sorry, but what I can do? What's done is done. Was it because he was getting closer and closer to Javarsh? The scapegrace characteristic kept trying to rise up and dominate Callius' mind. The more swords, the better, but only up to three. He didn't need more. Callius tried to hold Zornik between his teeth, and then spat it out. Are you doing something crazy again? Never mind. Instead, he looked closely at the sword. Short blade. A size that could fit into one hand. For throwing. It was a throwing dagger. If it had been as big as his body, he would have given it away to any of the knights who wanted it. However, since it was small and easy to throw, Callius kept it as useful. Oh, and of course. Zornik's own pair of swords did not disappear along with his own body. So, his great sword went to Aaron. His broadsword was handed over to one of the knights who'd followed Zornik. What was your name again? It's Jack. He was the leader of the group of knights who'd followed Zornik. Thinking he might protest otherwise, Callius had given him another broadsword comparable to the one Zornik had. Pilgrims and knights were always searching for a better sword. Jack, who had been bought by the price of one sword, quietly followed Callius. Of course, the sword was not the whole reason for following Callius, but the rest of it was obvious. Rather, they now faced a different problem. What are we going to do? What else? We have to get into the castle, either by breaking through the front or by some trick. At first glance, the great army investing the castle seemed to number in the thousands. Common orcs, as well as orc warriors. And at their head, red hair that signified a great orc warrior could be seen from afar. Could they break through an army of that size? With only forty or so knights? Nonsense. We'll have to wait until dawn. I guess so. We probably wouldn't be doing anything until dawn. Callius quietly looked at the faraway orcs dotted on the snow, one by one. Especially that red hair. The great warrior. No. To be honest, maybe it looked a bit like him, but he couldn't say for certain. It was too far away. But he'd find out soon. That one wasn't the type to die so easily. The dark night sky. The north wind grew sharper as time passed. Its sting getting worse and worse as the sun went down. Camping in this weather. Was asking to be frozen to death. But they had to. It's really harsh to not even light a fire. I think I'm getting frostbite. If a knight in the north gets frostbite, it's time to retire. Just wrap it up tight. It was a conversation between Alan and Aaron. At some point, the two had become quite friendly. However, the icy weather of the north did not show any signs of friendliness. This was wartime. They couldn't set up a camp to rest, and couldn't even light a bonfire. They had to depend on the moonlight, accustom themselves to the darkness, and stay up all night with wide open eyes, searching for an opportunity. Callius. What? If you want to become a hero, why don't you become the bait and catch their attention? Am I such a goody two-shoes? We'd love you if you were. If you die, I'll turn you into a sword, cherish you for the rest of my life, regularly dust you clean, and then pass you on to Emily. Stop saying unlucky things. At Bernard's joking chuckle, the faces of Callius and the nearby knights softened. However, the sharp wind blowing like knives quickly brought back their frowns. We'll freeze to death if we go on like this. Aren't old men supposed to be wise? 
Give us an idea or something. Do you think old people can be sharp-witted? Elderly wisdom tends to be forgotten with time. I'm an old man who can't even remember what he ate for breakfast, so what exactly do you want from me? T.T.T. Callius, silenced, contemplated how to deal with this situation. The entire area around the castle is occupied by the orcs. What should I do? How can I enter the castle safely and with least damage? Is there no way to safely join the forces inside Javarsh? He kept turning the problem over in his mind. However, he couldn't find a good solution. Callius, who was wearing the cloak of twilight, stroked the pommel of his sword, exhaling a white breath. It was a troubled night. He lifted his head up to the sky, at the starlight pouring down. Despite the situation on the ground, the stars above still peacefully emanated their own light, and the river of stars curled together to form the Milky Way. That was then. Hook! Hyung! He could hear a sword cutting through the wind. Walking through the forest, he could see Emily wielding a sword from afar. Even though most of the knights crouched on the ground to preserve their body heat, Emily was swinging her sword so hard that steam was rising from her body. If you sweat, you'll get frostbite. I can't miss a day of training. I always swing my sword like this before I go to bed. It was bronze. He'd approached Emily as if he was curious. You can learn by watching. If you're a servant, shouldn't you be aiming to become a knight? I'm pretty satisfied with being a servant though. No ambition. Beautiful but practical. Gervain's swordsmanship emphasized simple and practical movements. However, something else was mixed in it. A splendid swordsmanship that emphasized speed and changeability was mixed with the Gervain sword. A swordsmanship that resembled Callius. Gervain's restrained swordsmanship and such splendid speed and flexibility hiding within it. It's like watching a tiger tearing apart a flower garden. It was Jack who'd spoken. Jack, who had a large scar on his lips, praised Emily's swordsmanship with the unique flowery style of aristocratic speech. But there were quite a few parts that Callius thought were overkill. You praise her too highly. Children at this age are easily influenced by people close to them. Callius didn't know what Jack meant by that. Emily's swordsmanship was indeed very similar to that of Callius. Her talent was enough to imitate the swordsmanship of Callius just by seeing it a few times. The swordsmanship I've been struggling with for years. Was it so easy to put into your own sword? It was hard to believe that she was only a twelve-year-old. She also put in enough effort, so it was no shame to call her a true genius. My apologies. I'd heard of Lady Emily's genius, but seeing it up close, it is even sadder. He was a talker. Was it because his lips were torn? Callius sympathized with his words as he thought about it. Emily's swordsmanship wasn't perfect, but she was still able to find her way without a guide. When it came to swordsmanship, such talent was not commonplace. However, disappointingly, the divine blood to support that talent was blocked. If only her divine blood had flowed freely, she would have been able to face more powerful enemies with the protection of divine power around herself. With the body of a child. An orc? It would be difficult to catch just a single beast. Callius fell into an internal struggle as he looked at Emily's swordsmanship and considered the upcoming war. Annoying little kid. Somehow, we two became entangled with each other. There's nothing special about it, not some deep friendship or relationship, but there's a bond from being together up to this point. That talent is just too good to be left alone. Maybe I can help her out a little? Even Bernard seems to care about Emily for some reason. Emily. Follow me. Suddenly? Where are we going? Her training interrupted, Emily frowned but she still followed him without hesitation. She would not have followed him in the past, but at some point, the heart of the girl full of aspirations had recognized him. He was not just some simple maniac and scapegrace like his reputation. No, 
in the girl's mind, Callius was already not a scapegrace. As they went deeper and deeper through the quiet forest path, they found a suitable cave. Go in. Are you trying to lock me up? Is there any benefit to me in locking you up? Stop talking nonsense and go in. Even with Callius' push, Emily's feet did not move easily. The girl's front teeth bit her lower lip, and her arms squeezed the hem of her trousers. You're doing this because I'm getting in the way of the war. A normal person would console her at this point saying that wasn't the case, but Callius wasn't someone normal. So you know, that's good. Chapter 38 Divine power flows throughout this world, to the extent that every citizen of a country may have divine power simply by virtue of being born in a country serving a god. However, just having divine power is not enough for it to be used. Skill in its use and growth in power can only come from tireless and repeated effort. But sometimes, there are people like Emily, born with a disability. Originally, divine power revolves around the outer parts of the body and you have to pull it in and circulate it inside your body. So the first step was to pull it into your body, but that's where Emily was stuck. So it's just a matter of piercing that blockage. Puduk Emily, who had her teeth bared, pretended to be calm and awkwardly tried to assume a relaxed posture. I'll be fine. I won't hold you back. I'm confident I'll fight better than bronze. Comparing yourself to something like Bruns is already proof that you're holding me back. Bruns would have shed some big fat tears if he'd heard the conversation, but fortunately, only Callius and Emily were present. Are you going to throw me away? Make me wait here for the war to end? You're saying something strange. I never picked you up. I never picked you up, but now I'm throwing you away, isn't that absurd? You're being difficult on purpose, you freak. Then I'll talk straight like a freak. I approached Emily and stretched out my hand, shining with divine power. What, what are you doing? I will pierce your divine blood. Ah. Uh. Divine blood? Suddenly? Like you said, in your current state, you're only going to hold me back in battle. So I have to make you useful, even if only a little. That's absurd. The Lord tried to help me, too. The church said that a long time ago, they could pierce the divine blood by pouring holy water all over the body. Now they had no more holy water. Making it impossible. That's what Emily would have heard. But. I can. Only me in this world. But it wasn't as simple as it sounded. Artificially piercing the divine blood could easily cause complications. And if the pierced blood didn't heal, divine power would leak everywhere, mixing with the blood, accumulating blood pressure and causing death in the end. So, the first requirement had to be a person who could precisely manipulate their spirit power. And the second requirement was for them to be someone the patient could trust. The divine blood was the second most important part a knight had to protect, after their head and heart. And finally, one had to be able to completely heal the divine blood that had been pierced. In short, someone with access to holy water. And Callius was the only person in Carpe who met all these conditions. Although some holy water would be wasted, it was enough if he made some more later. Valthra's tears could be nurtured if certain conditions were met, and Callius was somebody who knew all those conditions. This battlefield isn't going to be fatal enough for me to need holy water three times. I'd be lying if I said this is worth it, but it's a kind of investment. As an adult, and as a pilgrim wielding a single sword, it's my duty to make sure that this young, fragile seed can germinate with a solid foundation. A fragile girl who realizes her own weakness more than anybody else, and disguises her earnest wish not to be abandoned with an incongruent serenity. So that Emily can bloom properly. Give me your wrist. Can I really trust you? If you're fine with living like this for the rest of your life, you don't have to. Emily pondered for a moment, before reaching out. I'm a Gervain. It's not death that I'm afraid of. I didn't ask you. 
Ask me. Fine, what are you afraid of? Uselessness. I'm more afraid of that. So, Callius. So, I. Make me useful. Then I will tell you one thing. You will become another useful sword for me. Emily nodded her little head. Soon, Callius' divine power permeated into the girl's body. Hyuk! As the errant divinity suffused her whole being, the girl was sweating profusely. Unfamiliar pain and torpidity assaulted her in tandem as pure divine power cleared the pathways for the divine blood to flow for the first time. However, at some point, Emily got used to the pain. No, for the first time in her life, she felt the euphoria of power flowing through her. Don't get too excited. As much as Emily was sweating, Callius was sweating as well. Because Emily's condition was more serious than expected. It's not just one place that's blocked. As if someone had done it intentionally, her divine blood was blocked in several places. It was not a problem that could be solved in just one go. I'm going crazy. I started with a light heart, but as things progressed, anxiety began to creep in, like a serpent slowly raising its head from hibernation. Even the thought that I might die here if I made a single mistake instead of in the coming war, filled my head. Emily's divine blood was pierced again. Ouch! Perhaps in excruciating pain, Emily immediately spewed out some blood. The satisfaction of divine power flowing into her divine blood disappeared, and her complexion was pale as if she was about to die. Not yet. It was still too early for her to drink the holy water. Be patient. A full seven out of the hundred blood vessels had been clogged. She had to wait till he pierced them all. Callius' shoulders, with his hands on Emily's back, were heavy. However, he had to continue. If he stopped now, Emily would die without even being able to bloom. Come. There was a ripple of shock as if something had exploded inside her body. Ugh. Patter. The dripping blood and its thick scent tickled his senses. But not yet. The end was still far away. Immediately, he pierced the next blockage. Come. Come. Kwong. The small body staggered as if it couldn't stand the pain. This must have been enough to cause even a grown man to cry and ask him to stop. Ugh, ugh. But Emily still tried to endure it. Even a little girl was trying so hard, so how could he show a weak heart? Finally, he managed to finish piercing all the block divine blood. A time of unpausing toil had passed in heavy silence, but it was not in vain. Callius, who had succeeded in his task, took out the holy water. Drink. Slurp. Damn. Though he thought she was holding up well, Emily suddenly lost consciousness. Already unconscious. Her eyes were pale, and the black blood she'd spat out was enough to wet the floor. Her condition was worse than expected. Somehow, she lost consciousness even though she didn't make a single moan from the time he pierced the fifth blockage. Callius immediately fed her more holy water. Putting his fingers in her mouth, pouring holy water, and pressing on her tongue. Forcing her to drink. But was it because he was too careless? Come on, breathe. Emily stopped breathing. Callius cursed and took a long breath. Koak! One. Cough. Cough. Emily's complexion, which had become pale after vomiting a mass of black blood, slowly returned to normal. An hour later, Callius grabbed the girl's wrist and began passing his power into her. Not only giving her his own energy, he even began to guide her own divine power. Along the pathway of the divine blood, the divine power gradually gathered from the outside and circulated little by little, little by little, to the center. Towards her elixir field. Look at this. With just a little guidance, she was already taking the initiative. Taking to the process like a fish to water. Don't get excited. The pathway of Emily's divine blood, which had just been pierced, was still not completely cleared. 
if you run too fast, you are more likely to get hurt. It is more difficult to heal internal wounds than external ones. Now that holy water was available, those could be cured easily, but there was no need to foster such bad habits from the start. Callius guided Emily's power for an hour or two so that the divine blood that had been pierced would not be blocked again. Around the time when the drops of sweat had cooled down and settled all over his body. Gradually, a soft light began to shine. From Emily's body. A soft light signifying the flow of divine power. Done. The man removed his hands from the girl's body and raised his eyes sharply. His eyes were dark and his skin flaky, as if he hadn't slept for three or four days, but he had no regrets. It's brilliant. The girl in front of him was covering the world with a dazzling gleam. An effulgence of silver. Like a flower, blooming. Kuang. The gigantic form fell down. Its fur was matted with blood, and the leathery skin covered with sword scars. It's all raggedy. Still, I did well enough. So praise me. It's useless. It's not a technique to tear up the opponent like this. It's a technique to cover up a one-shot skill inside a dozen other normal skills. You're just nagging. It's fine because I got it in the end. On the battlefield, are you only going to kill one guy? If so, then it's fine. TSK. In front of Emily was a huge bear with horns on its forehead. It was a demonic beast that was the original owner of the cave that Emily and Callius had entered. It was a perfect opponent for Emily, who had finally pierced through her divine blood. A bit too enthusiastic, but not bad. It was the first time in her life that she was dealing with spiritual power, so how could that be? Even so, her talent was real. The girl was already gathering her divine power inside the elixir field. But it wasn't harmful. Not all swordsmanship is learned from others. There were many types of swordsmanship among the knights. Congenital, and acquired. Many of them started as squires of other knights, learned how to hold a sword, and learned swordsmanship through training and guidance. Most of the time, that was the normal approach. But not for Emily. The young girl's talent was that dazzling. Emily was a born knight. A talent that no one could teach. To put it simply, she was a child who could take care of herself even if left alone. If you just stop her bad habits, she'll soar quickly. Unlike himself. This unlucky guy. What? What did you say? We can't even eat its meat anyway, so let's just peel off the skin as a souvenir and go. And this? You have good eyesight. The horns of horned bears can be made into artifacts, so it's better to collect them. They'll be useful. Callius turned over the bear's body with one hand and began skinning it. As if it was not something he had done once or twice, the skin was completely peeled off in the blink of an eye. It was not something that could be done easily if you didn't have moderate strength and dexterity. You do the horns. Yeah. Callius handed his dagger to Emily. The horns were easily harvested with Zornik. Leave the skin to bronze. He's uselessly good with leftovers. Yeah. Are we leaving now? Right. The day was already bright. The mornings were late in the north. They'd gotten delayed more than expected. Let's go. Yeah. Callius. Long shadows trailed after the dark-haired man and the girl accompanying him as they walked under the light of the dawn. In a while. Returning to the makeshift camp, Callius was immediately summoned by Bernard. Bernard took out the pipe from his mouth and puffed out smoke. What is it? So early in the morning? The problem is it's morning. What did you do with Emily? What would I have done with that little kid? Tell me the truth. Did you swallow a foghorn, too? His shout was like thunder. Callius, covering his ears, confided what had happened last night before the old man made even more noise. What, her divine blood? Yeah. 
I did a good job, so stop looking at me like a pedophile. I can't believe it. What kind of ability did you use to pierce Emily's divine blood? I don't know if it's something else. Did you think I would have pierced something other than her divine blood? Really, you didn't, right? Fuck, what do you see me as? As Callius spat out a curse, Bernard put down the pipe as if he was sorry. And started running right away. He seemed to be rushing to see Emily's condition. There was nothing wrong with that per se, but it highlighted the lack of credibility of a famous maniac. After Callius waited for a while with his arms folded, Bernard finally came back with a smile on his face and said, Callius, you've never been a kind person to anyone I've seen. I don't know how you did it, but I have to ask you this. What's the purpose of piercing Emily's divine blood? It was just a whim. I, too, had scrutinized Emily's clogged divine blood carefully. Even a paladin in the master's realm would have said that it was up to God to fix it. It must have been no easy task. Right? That's right. Emily almost died along the way. And I'm exhausted, too. I think you already know, right? What do you mean? What do I know? Stop playing the fool. I know your personality, so I'm sure that you won't suffer that much for just somebody in the family. So I'm guessing that you've noticed. If that's the case. Did Emily tell you? That in fact, you. You are her father. Chapter 39 Callius stiffened. I, father. He stared at the ceiling of the hut with an empty gaze. Didn't you know? No. How am I supposed to know? I can't believe it even after hearing it myself. Ah, uh, then just forget what I just said. As if I can forget about it. Bernard coughed in his sarcastic reply. Thinking about it, he let out a bewildered laugh. I was going to tell you when the time was right. Why did you do something like this? So it's my fault? Well, it's not a bad thing. You even pierced Emily's divine blood, something that no one else could do. How overwhelming must it be that it was her father who managed it? Now that child has been rid of her biggest anxiety. Bernard tried to cover up his mistake. How effective! A splendid attempt at lightening the mood. Unfortunately, Callius was not swept away by the refreshing atmosphere. Are you sure it's my kid? A kid I don't even know of, how could it be mine? I'm sure as can be that she's your child. I heard the story from the Count himself. Inhaling from the pipe again, Bernard started speaking slowly, exhaling puffs of smoke. It was a dawn just before sunrise. A strong and bleak wind was blowing through the north, much like today. Stop blabbering and come to the point. Don't test my patience too much. You damn kid. Bernard, who'd spat out a curse, left the pretense behind and cut to the chase. Ten years ago, someone left Emily with the family. The Count immediately searched for the mother of the child that had been left behind, and found her identity. Who is she? It was the attendant of a young noblewoman named Ailey who left Emily behind. Ailey? It's a pretty common name. Which family's daughter was she? Barrierin. She was a baron's daughter, Ailey de Barrierin. Ailey de Barrierin. She was from a noble family located in the south, whose lands are famous for blueberries. How did you meet that young girl? That's what I want to ask. Callius. How old was this bastard? Callius H. Now. 26. So. He slept with the young lady when he was about fourteen, one. Or rather, the one who is now me, did that. This guy deserved to be called the prodigal son of the church. But I don't feel particularly good. I got the responsibility without any of the fun. That's fucked up. A passionate night with a young lady, whom I can't even remember. Emily was born from that joining. A. Lee, ugh. All of a sudden, foreign memories come rushing in. A woman's face. 
her terrible complexion only adds to my confusion. It feels like my head is going to split. I'd hoped not, but I guess it's true. Damn Callius. Does Emily know? She knows. She knows that her father is a maniac who ruined the family name, and is also called the prodigal son of the church. Damn it. Callius covered his face with both hands. It was only now that all of Emily's reactions so far began to make sense. No, honestly, she's not my child. She is Callius' child. So, I don't have to feel this guilt and this sense of obligation. Obviously, that's the case. But, now I am Callius. Who? He took a deep breath, wiped his face and looked at Bernard. What should I do now? Why are you asking me that, you bastard? Now that you know the truth, be nice to Emily. That, A. Lee. No, where's the young lady A. Lee? SSSSHIA. Bernard, exhaling another puff of smoke, looked at Callius with bitter eyes. Seems she died. Unfortunate. Then there was only one person left in this world who Emily could depend on. There was only Callius. There's no way that Count Gervain would have behaved as her grandfather. He could understand why Emily was so close to Bernard. But why did Bernard love that child so much? Because she's my child. His thoughts were a mess. He didn't know how to untangle this tangled web of relationships. What are you going to do now? What do you mean? It's not the right time, but you found out anyway. Since that's the case, you'll have to start getting your act together as a father from now on. A twelve-year-old daughter suddenly popped up. Do you think I can just accept it that easily? To be honest, I don't feel any shame. Emily is a child born of the original Callius, and she is not mine. Hey! How could such words come out of a father's mouth? If you are the man with the dick, you must take responsibility. How do I become a father? What should I do? I have no idea. You must have some idea, don't you? No, because I don't have children either. Yes? What did you do all your life that you aren't married even in this age? I devoted my all to the god, Valtherus. Damn it, you're useless. I really thought he could give me some decent advice. Hmm. So, why don't you two have a good meal together? When people eat something delicious, they naturally start talking about this and that, don't they? In this situation, where anything could happen any moment. Even if war breaks out, we'll still eat. We'll still shit and piss. What difference does it make? And isn't a battlefield a place with an uncertain future? In my opinion, Emily. She's not the type to flinch from war. Her body will be itching to test its strength, since her divine blood has just been pierced. A twelve-year-old girl. Of course, if we reach the castle, we can stop her, but until then, there is nothing we can do. Okay. It's not my place to interfere. You knew pretty late, but you're still her one and only father. Good luck. Tuck, tuck. Bernard patted my shoulders and went out for a walk, or to hunt. This is driving me crazy. As I was pondering the situation for a while. Why did you call me again? Emily came. Why are you looking at me like that? I heard from Grandpa that you called me, didn't you? That damned old man. I wasn't even mentally prepared, but he called Emily here with this timing? What, why are you staring at me like that? Looking at her closely, there were similarities. Emily was also quite beautiful, probably because Callius' face didn't lose to anybody in handsomeness either. Fiery eyes, too, and jet black hair. And the gray pupils that represented the girl's bloodline. Although she was young now, in time she would bloom into a strong flower, capable of withstanding the harsh northern winds. How do you feel? You mean my body? It's good. It feels much lighter and stronger than before. Now, I can even win against the orcs without poisoning them. 
That's not what I was asking. I didn't know what to say. Bernard said that she already knew. But wasn't it a bit strange to suddenly call her my daughter? Then, you're lucky. Don't worry, I won't hold you back. It's not that. Huh. Then what is it? Callius scratched the back of his neck in bewilderment. Have you eaten? No. Not yet. Then let's have dinner together. Suddenly? You usually tell me to go away and not disturb you. I thought you liked to eat alone. I thought so too. The only thing I could enjoy in this world was the food. Shit. I wanted to turn back time right now, but I didn't have that kind of an ability. I never thought she would be my daughter. I'm giving you a special chance to eat together. What exactly is special? Emily seemed troubled, as if she sensed the strange atmosphere. But after ruffling her own hair a bit, she nodded her head. Wait. I went out of the cabin and looked for Bruns in a hurry. Bruns? Yes, yes. What? Where's the cloth bag? It's here. But what's going on? I need some food. Is there anything suitable inside? Ah, uh, yes. There's some roe deer and wild boar meat from Master's Catch last time. That's enough. Should I help? No, you keep doing what you're doing. Bruns was tanning the hide of the horned bear that Emily had caught. Because of the size, he was even having to work with a few of the nameless knights, so I didn't ask Bruns to help this time. I have to do it. Due to the circumstances, I can't treat you to something great. Still, it's the first meal the father and the daughter will have together. It's better if the father prepares the meal himself. It's not difficult. During the past few years, Callius had wandered all over Carpe, and ate well on his own. Something of this level was not difficult. Callius immediately lit the fire. Then, he affixed the whole of the meat and placed it over the bonfire. The quality of the meat itself wasn't bad. If so, how would it taste? The answer was that it depended on the spices. Because a large part of the flavor of food came from the spices. And Callius had the finest spices, bought in Tristar, in his hands. A variety, including precious ones like salt and pepper, to delight the senses. Perfect. Now it was just a matter of waiting. Would this be enough to reach Emily's heart by starting the attack through her stomach? Seemed doable. Oh, Callius. Are you cooking your food? The smell is something else. It looks delicious. Can I have some? It was Alan and Aaron. They thought he was pretty friendly, and they usually talked politely. But today was not a usual day. Callius looked at them with cold eyes. You'd better sod off. Oh, yep. Alan turned back right away, and Aaron also tried to turn around quickly but stumbled and fell in the process. Ugh. Due to Aaron's enormous size, dust rose in the dry wind. Useless bastard. Go away right now. Yes, yep. Sorry. The dust flew in the air, but as expected, Callius was already far away with the smoked boar meat in hand. What's the matter? It's nothing. I don't think it's nothing. Eat this. Callius sliced the meat with a sharp knife and handed the piece to Emily on a plate. Oh, thank you. Eat it. They sat side by side on a fallen log and started eating. There was no conversation whatsoever. Only the sound of knives and forks, accompanied by the dry wind, could be heard. The rest was a deafening silence. What should I say? Emily was also being quiet for some reason. They didn't even make eye contact, just stared at their own plates as they ate. This kid must know I'm her father. What is she thinking? The more he thought about it, the more he felt at sea. Fighting an orc warrior seemed easier in comparison. He'd rather ask Emily's attendant what she liked. Where did your servant go? I don't think I've seen her in a while. 
she's dead. She was hiding but got hit blindly by an orc sword. I see. He hadn't known because he hadn't been interested. I guess you weren't very close. They've been with me since I was little. Nia since I was five, and Wendy since I was seven. Not anymore, though. Is that so? Even so, it didn't show in her demeanor. Or else he would have found out before now. Had she been witnessing and enduring, with that small body, the deaths of those she loved? Even so, she never gave up, but kept swinging her sword and tempering herself. Strong. She was one strong kid. Why was a child so proud that she would accept the harsh storms of the world and the deaths of her loved ones, and quietly endure it all despite the pain? A child who did not even call her father, father, was afraid of being abandoned, and yet tried to prove herself with a sword. That child, was his own daughter. If it weren't for that old man, I wouldn't have known for the rest of my life. Who would have thought that such a proud child was the daughter of a maniac? It seemed incredible. It's all right, though. Now I won't have let them depart in vain. Cook. Emily poked the last piece of meat with a fork, put it in her mouth and chewed. The child who had been imprisoned in a bandit's den just the other day, became an adult within such a short time. A child who had gone through a lot at once, grew up to fit with her environment. But for some reason, Callius felt a pang in his chest at the sight. I ate well. It tasted good. If you want, we can do it again next time. Fine. Yeah. Emily handed him the plate back and stood up, holding her sword. What are you going to do now? Training. Was there another twelve-year-old girl in this world who could talk about training with such a bright smile? Then I. That was then. Suddenly, the night started making a ruckus. What's going on? I don't know either. But Master Bernard's signal stopped. Old man? Callius, who made eye contact with Emily, quickly grabbed his sword and ran out. As he widened his senses and found Bernard's aura, a plane spread out before him as if waiting. Bernard was there. He was slowly pulling out his sword. What's going on? Pooh. It wasn't Bernard's voice that resolved Callius' doubts, but the sound of horns from the battlefield. It's starting. The green waves straddling the pure white snow began to invade the gray castle. The war. It was about to start. Chapter 40 The orcs have been meticulously accumulating their strength. They've prepared steadily, with their past defeats as a stepping stone. The roar of axes forged in bitter defeat had been mixed in the howling northern winds for many years. The north wind carved through the flesh of combatants and engraved deep wounds on the castle walls. Aia! The sounds of screams resounded across the north. Quang! As the orcs advanced, giant demonic beasts also rushed by their side one after another. When the human soldiers tried to block the demonic beasts rushing to destroy the castle walls like living battering rams, they were brutally trampled. Still, Gervain is somehow holding on. The golden-haired man, with his black hood pulled all the way back, muttered as if in surprise. Throughout the long history of Carpe, Gervain alone has protected the north. No matter how prepared the orcs may be, this is not a place to fall so easily. Ramatu of Kratian spoke in a fond tone. Habitually tapping the ground with his staff, he twisted his lips. To think that a family with such a glorious history is about to fall to the minions of the empire. If you are a minion, why do you sound so broken-hearted? Ramatu clicked his tongue at Luthien's smirking tone. As expected, the elites of Jervain are all tied down in the east, so there's nothing they can do to help. Kuang. You succeeded. Yes. Ramada's eyes wrinkled at the corners as he stared at the castle walls with a bitter gaze. The castle that symbolized the north. Staunch Javarsh, facing the rushing horde of giant demonic beasts that spent their lives to make even a single crack in its defense. 
However, the northern soldiers did not hesitate a moment to sacrifice themselves, blocking the advance of the orcs and the demonic beasts. The battle raged on, fierce and terrible. Calavan, brother, what's your move? With a smile on his lips, Luthien asked Calavan von Gervain, who stood at his back. Calavan bit his lips, as some indescribable emotion welled up within him. The important thing is timing. That's right. Timing. Orcs don't seize the place, yet Gervain is destroyed. You have to take the castle at just the right time, sly like a serpent. Luthien was making a scene. Seeing his antics, Calavan exhaled heavily and tried to speak. I. Yying. Oh. When Calavan was about to say something. Suddenly the wind changed direction. Soon, Ramada's lips drew into a thin line, and Luthien's eyes turned cold. Has he recovered already? That resilience is just like a troll. Maybe he is some kind of divine grace. TSK. Ramada glanced at Luthien to see if the latter might know something, but Luthien shook his head with a look of disgust. He just grew further after his duel with Keltuk. Even if he's a maniac, a Gervain is still a Gervain. Ha ha. Isn't it more fun this way? Not for me, at least. It isn't fun at all. Taking a final look at the jet black hair and fluttering red cloak that mowed through the orcs like a ravaging storm, Luthien turned his back. But even so, it won't change anything. I'll take care of him myself. Chwak. A sword that fell cleanly. Cutting through a green head. Not a single drop of blood stained the predator's sword. A quickness incomparable to before. My body feels light. The sword in his hand was lighter as well. As if it had no weight whatsoever. As if it was part of his body, one with his arm. That's how Callius felt. Although death had brushed close, his battle with Keltuk had also made him grow. Six Peak Flower's technique had risen to the next level, and even the martial skills of the Silver Flower Wave Sword could be used when convenient. Looking back on it with new eyes, his swordsmanship thus far had been cluttered and irregular. To abolish his old habits and re-establish a style again from scratch would be quite a cumbersome task. However, there was an army of orcs spanning the horizons like a green sea in front of Callius. It was the perfect stage to get some practice. Sook! With a single stroke of his sword, orc soldiers' heads soared into the air. The sharp edge of the blood-soaked predator's sword cleaved through hard skin and iron bones with ease. Captain is opening a path. Break through. Kill one more if you got time to talk. Callius sword dance boosted the morale of his followers, and the knights swung their swords with vigor. But if somebody asked who stood out the most among them? Callius looked back at the knights, each of whom was fighting fiercely. Among them, one left the most brilliant trace. A child, even with a form smaller than the others, was cutting a swath through the orcs without hesitation. It was Emily. Pack pick pack pick. The scorching stings of her twin-edged rapier, coupled with her fox-like agility, allowed her to slowly but steadily defeat one orc after another. No need to worry there. The more Emily experienced real battle, the stronger she would become much like himself. Emily was a hardy flower, slowly blooming on the blood-soaked battlefield. Callius. Chijijijik. The nearby orcs were suddenly submerged in a thunderous explosion. Bernard appeared, with even his beard looking disheveled. We have to move forward. Since we're at this point, there's no turning back. Quickly. I know. Shrum. Callius, holding the predator sword, erupted with pure divine power. Sword petals appeared on the surface of the blade, and a strange silver light enveloped him. Let's go! Right! Silver flower wave sword, raging flower wave. A rush of silver petals, raging like stormy waves in a furious sea. Qua! Chwa-ja-ja-ja-ja-ja! 
and a thunderbolt enveloping it all, spreading destruction wherever it touched. With a single technique, the orcs were struck down under the storm and thunder. Quaan. Now, immersed in the joy of battle, Bernard led the knights forward. Move. If we don't break through now, there's no future for any of us. Go. Go damn it. I'm going. Cock. Hey. Alan, come to your senses. If you hesitate now, you'll die. I know, Aaron. Those who fell, tried to tie down the enemies for the sake of those still standing. Those who fall, try to grab the enemy's ankles, and those who do not, move forward. In that fierce and tangled battlefield, each individual's high and low justice clashed. However, in Callius' eyes there were only those who blocked and those who wanted to break through, so he only kept cutting and slashing at the forefront. For the past three years, he had internalized the way to survive in this mad world. Cut, and you can live. A path can be opened just by cutting. Stop cutting, and you will die. A terribly simple logic. He had engraved it in his heart. There is an old saying, that children grow up by fighting. Because human beings mature by feeling various emotions and various pains as they strike others, are struck in turn, and keep fighting. You've grown up. Elberton, standing on top of the fortress walls and looking down on the battlefield, thought that the old saying rang true. That kid had grown up. Looking at him, who would think he was the shame of the North? One who had been called a fool, now cleaved through the battlefield and opened a path. A new wind is blowing. Cough, cough. Elberton let out a bloody cough, but ignored it and kept looking only at Callius. The knights following Callius, who pierced the flank of the orc army, were breaking through the path straight to Javarsh. And where that knot of melee battle unfolded, a silver flower was blooming. He pierced their flank, aiming for the moment when they were rushing forward. It's not some easy thing to do even with Bernard by your side. Bernard didn't have the kind of personality to make such a judgment. Perhaps it was Callius' decision. He was lucky. He got the timing right. But without the ability to support it, it would have collapsed quickly. Yet Callius managed it. Now, he had reached the end of the Orc army ranks and was on the verge of joining Gervain's soldiers. Was my judgment right or wrong to kick you out? Did you grow up like that because you were chased out? Or did you always hold such a possibility? Elbert and shook his head at his meaningless thoughts. Those vague ideas had no significance anymore. He was the Gervain, who must protect the North, before he was the father of a maniac. It was time to sweep away those cloudy thoughts with a strong north wind, and act as the master of the north. Taz. King. Jumping off the walls, the supreme ruler of the north unsheathed his sword. Kwong. A step, and his posture gave rise to a new wind. Hung. The sword that accompanied the beginning of the north. The wind that sprang forth from the storm sword, Callus cleave the battlefield in half like the miracle of Moses. Step by step, his heavy gait carried him to the line separating the orcs and the Gervain soldiers, his black hair and red cloak fluttering behind him. Callius. The eyes of the sun, covered in green blood, did not consider his father worth looking at. So, the father, too, did not treat him as a son. The war has just begun. Do you need a break already? No need. Then go get them. Sacrifice the heads of our enemies who ravaged the north. At Elberton's cry, the Gervain soldiers raised their swords towards the sky. And Callius, too, turned his back on him again. Leaving behind Javarsh, that he had barely reached after such hardship. Teek, teek. Ha! Callius, who could not even take off his armor properly, sat down on a chair as if lying down to rest, placing his feet on an unknown piece of luggage strewn nearby and exhaling a long breath. Three days. In the battlefield that had lasted for three days, 
he had teetered between life and death dozens of times and had surpassed his own limit hundreds of times. It was not difficult to deal with the orcs. Not just orc soldiers, even orc warriors were no longer difficult for him to deal with. Rather, they were just the right level for practicing and catching his own bad habits. The problem was them. The giant beasts. Who knew how the orcs had tamed such beasts, but they now fought side by side. The beasts were the size of houses, so no matter how good one's sword skills were, a brief mistake in battle was enough to invite death. Of course, they were too big, so they had dull senses, and stabbing the eyes or a vital point could knock one down. Master, here, please drink some water. Gulp, gulp. Callius drank all the water from the bucket in one go, and started wiping the blood and sweat from his weapon with a wet towel. Good that you didn't die. He, you know best how tough my lifeline is. Ha ha. Brun survived until the respite that followed the long three-day battle. There were some shallow wounds on him, but compared to the soldiers and knights strewn around all over the place, he still looked like he had physical strength to spare. How much longer will this go? I don't know. I don't know if this battlefield will go on for a month or even a year. Despite his words, he doubted it'd last that long. From the enemy's point of view, they wanted to quickly capture the castle before reinforcements arrived for the defenders. It was the orcs who didn't have time. In contrast, the defenders only needed to weather the siege. Has it been reduced by about half? The defending army had been reduced by half. Because the elites of Gervain were absent, and the numerical inferiority of their side was also evident. The situation was where they had only managed to avoid the worst outcome. How about the old man, and Emily? Both of them are resting. You never know when another fight will break out. Both suffered only minor wounds. Neither were seriously hurt. If you call that luck, then they were lucky. Ah, a knight named Alan lost an eye. He's still so young. Is that so? He lost an eye in the war. As a knight, he was fortunate not to have lost his limbs, but it would take time to adapt nonetheless. And the other knights who followed me. It'd be right to say that about half died. Right. Even skilled knights died. Not all of them could live on. It left a bitter taste, but he couldn't help it. Because this was a battlefield. But from now on, more and more people are going to follow Master. I heard the soldiers whispering, I could clearly see with my two eyes and hear with my two ears, they were singing Master's praises. Bruns. Yep. Master. There's been a lot of talk that Master should be the new Lord of the North rather than that Calavan or Kilavan or whoever. You don't need to worry. Noisy. Yep. However, Bruns was still all smiles. You don't even know when you'll die, so why are you having so much fun? It'll all be over when you die. But where's Calavan? Well, the soldiers didn't seem to know either. Hm, I see. Fatalite's wheel. It probably had something to do with this quest. It doesn't really matter. Yes? What do you mean? It's nothing. Fatalite's wheel. Number of orcs killed, 1172. Number of beasts killed, 486. Number of people saved, 193. Reward, a plus? If there's a knot, just cut it. Then the rewards will go up. That's all I can think of right now. Anything else doesn't matter. There are things other than that that are much more worrisome. What I'm most worried about. The most troublesome situation. Because it has reached the point where it can't be suppressed any longer. Callius von Gervain. A strong-looking old man, with wavy gray hair and a short ponytail, called to Callius. Noctul. The butler of the Gervain family, who'd sworn his lifelong allegiance to Elberton. Noctul. His skills were on par with a paladin. 
an old man who maintained an upright posture like a well-forged sword. A butler. At least, that's what he called himself. His Excellency is summoning you. Elbert and Summons. Originally, I would have gone without protesting. But that's not who I am right now. Only one being can tell me to come and go as they please. The God in heaven, Valtherus, is the only one. So if the Count wants to see me, he must come to me directly. Go tell him, loyal dog. The characteristic, scapegrace of the Count family. It started dominating my sense of self. Thank <laughs> you.